Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Today is January the 5th, 2020. Uh, the Board of Education and Superintendents of the Rochester City School District, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, today we have a pretty full agenda. It is uh, largely going to be run by other board members because they are chairs of the various committees that are up for today. So now that this meeting has been convened, um, I think the first thing on our agenda is the consideration of speakers. Madam Clerk, do we have speakers for today? We do. We actually had two speakers recorded for tonight, but actually one parent did say that her issue has been resolved. And so we are happy to welcome to uh, the Zoom meeting, uh, Ms. Claire Labrosa, a staff member who will be addressing the board regarding COVID and face-to-face -face instruction and safety protocols. Ms. Labrosa, are you here? Hi, yes, I'm here. Wonderful, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, so my name is Claire Labrosa. I'm a graduate of the RCSD. I'm an ENL teacher in the district. Uh, I'm a resident of the city of Rochester and I'm a parent to three kids ages two to nine. Um, so today was our first day returning to face-to-face -to -face teaching and learning since March of last year. My school building was visited by central office staff who didn't follow COVID safety protocols. Um, they were standing in groups, shoulder to shoulder, not six feet apart. Um, and this is just an example of how even our management um, officials don't understand the safety guidelines. Um, there's a petition circulating right now signed by over 600 RCSD staff members, parents, um, and community members asking the district to delay face-to-face -face instruction until staff are properly trained and the holiday surge subsides. We were given a PowerPoint presentation in September and a handful of meetings were offered in the evenings after school hours. This is a far cry from the weeks that suburban educators received to prepare for in-person instruction. The most common medical condition our students have is asthma. The CDC lists moderate to severe asthma as a risk factor for severe COVID-19 disease. We should be taking extra precaution for the safety of our students with this illness, not opening buildings with a hope and a prayer during the height of the second wave. Um, the fatality rate for COVID in the United States is 1.7%. We have 350 students in our buildings for phase one. 1.7% of 350 is six students. I feel the district is willing to sacrifice the lives of six children with their reckless reopening plan that is considered higher risk, according to the CDC. Many decry the fact that the RCSD has stayed remote while the suburban school districts reopened. Um, Ibram X. Kendi quotes Lyndon B. Johnson in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by the chains and liberate him, bring him up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. Just so re um, just reopening schools during the height of a pandemic in which racist systems have caused the death of black and Latinx people three times the rate of white people and call it justice. It is not. This plan is not safe. Staff are not properly trained at no fault of their own. And I fear that we will see deaths in our community within the month and the responsibility lies squarely with our leaders in the district. Um, I'm gonna read the names of educators who have died from COVID. Um, and I want you to think about them when you're making your decisions. Elizabeth Toro, teacher, age 52. Lisa Palacio, an attendance clerk, age 43. Tim Gilbert, transportation, age 60. Mary Smith, teacher, age 49. Eric Ortiz, teacher, age 52. Jeremy Morgan, coach, age 44. Ellis Booth, principal, age 56. Sylvia Garcia, teacher, age 60. Arethia Tilford, attendance clerk, age 56. Antoine Bell, teacher, age 43. Cindy Torbett, counselor, age 55. Wilma Gale Bowen, school nurse, age 70. Terry Sherwin, an administrator. My apologies, your three minutes are up, but we do appreciate you joining us this evening. Thanks for listening. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, so long as, and, and she is clearly doing the job that the district has instructed or that the board has instructed her to do, but I would ask uh, for my colleagues and the clerk's consideration here. I would like the um, uh, uh, parent and teacher to continue to list the reading of the names of the people that passed away. If, if no one has any objection to that, I'd like for her to at least finish that. And then uh, she can submit the balance of her comments to the board. Thank you, Madam Clerk, uh, for doing your job. And I, I don't mean to suggest otherwise, but I just think at this particular point, 
for the cause that she is uh, representing, reminding us of the loss of life through COVID in the teaching instruction. I'd like for her to finish the list of names, if, if, you, if you would, Ms. Lombrosa. Yes, I can, thank you. Um, Dana Hall, secretary, age 56. Carmen Enriquez Chavez, instructional age, age 64. Laura Escalante, teacher, age 69. Samara Lyric Rand, teacher, age 25. Sandra Robinson, transportation supervisor, age 64. Melinda Rolig, teacher, age 37. Melissa Bowman, crossing guard, age 51. Darla Ahrens, as teacher, age 58. Mary Ward, teacher, age 51. Alexandra Chitwood, counselor, age, 50, or age 47. Ash Friedrich, teacher, age 40. Kimberly Flannery, food service, age 55. Sharon Schultz, food service, age 67. Kristen McClintock, athletic trainer, age 38. Angela Francis, teacher, age 43. Susan Keener, paraprofessional, age 53. Melissa Hilton, paraprofessional, age 46. Chow Li Yang, principal, age 53. Marshall McDuffie, school health aide, age 63. Julie Davis, teacher, age 49. Jennifer Crawford, paraprofessional, age 53. Carol Coates, teacher, age 46. Michelle McCracken, paraprofessional, age 53. Amelia Phillips, teacher, age 52. Heidi Hesley, teacher, age 47. Pamela Harris, counselor, age 60. Dana Inouye, administrative assistant, age 49. Tracy Lynn Garcia, student services, age 56. Demetria Bannister, teacher, age 28. Ashley Demarinus, teacher, age 34. Kelly Balser, school nurse, age 50. And this is just a short list. There are many, many more, including 500 students as well. Thank you, Ms. Labrosa. If you have any balance of comments, please feel free to submit them to our clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, I turn the gavel back over to you. And again, I wanna reiterate, we have an exceptional clerk uh, she is uh, enforcing the bylaws as required by the Board of Education. And uh, on occasion though, the board members such as myself can ask for an exception to those rules which she is rightly enforcing and uh, exercise that uh, request today. So thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, please continue to call the uh, balance of the um, speakers. We, that actually concludes our speakers for tonight. I do see that there's a comment from uh, Commissioner Powell, um, however. Commissioner Powell? Um, in, in light of that list of, of um, people who have either contracted or succumbed to COVID, and agenda doesn't list a uh, uh, moment of silence, Pledge of Allegiance, but if we could take a moment right now to um, just contemplate the, that those individuals and, and for those who are praying people, I'll lift them up in prayer. I think that would be appropriate. Why don't we set aside a few minutes, whether it's through prayer or pri private uh, mediation, um, please, uh, or contemplation, please take the time to do that in the next few uh, minutes or seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Powell, for reminding us that we should always spend time in our lives, professional and personal, to contemplate uh, how we can emotionally or spiritually support the loss of others. Uh, whether we do it on an agenda or not, uh, I think most of my colleagues, all of my colleagues, and certainly many, many throughout the district, spend a portion of their day remembering those that are struggling as a result of COVID and other challenges in their lives. So thank you again, Commissioner Powell. Um, Next item on our agenda is special meeting discussion items and uh, our Auditor General Anissa Henry Wheeler is going to provide uh, an update on the corrective action plan. Before you do that, President White, um, yes. I know that uh, Superintendent Myers had um, just a brief update um, regarding reopening. I was going to do that after these. Uh, I, I did see that text from you, and, but I was going to do that after uh, these in, uh, Anissa Henry Wheeler finished her report. Um, and it looks like, uh, yeah, because I, I didn't know what uh, uh, Anissa had maybe planned for the rest of the evening, and I knew Dr. Myers-Small was going to be around 
for the balance of this meeting. So, if if it uh, if there's no objection, I'd like um, Auditor General to go first, and then uh, we'll hear from the Superintendent on her. What I think is going to be a very positively received report on school opening. Uh, Anissa. Is, is Anissa there? She is. It does appear she's frozen. Um, oh, Anissa, are you back? Okay, um, you're un you are muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Thank you, President White. Um, I just wanted to, at the December 8th meeting with Freed Maxic, we did go over the corrective actions, which there were two. One in the area of information technology, requesting that the district document the uh, remote access protocols. And the second item being to do the work that we're doing on extra extracurricular plans. Um, while the board did get the information and did accept the actual audit report, it wasn't specifically stated that the management letter and the corrective action had been received. And for that reason, because I have to upload this in the state education department monitoring system, resolution 600 just clearly states the board has accepted the management letter comments from our external auditor as well as the district's corrective action plans. The time frame would be identified by the end of our fiscal year so that when the auditors come back, we have made uh, operating improvements to support uh, the district's operating and internal control environment. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear why the resolution's there. Going forward, you're going to see this resolution at the end of the year in December, along with my resolution to accept the external audit and the, in the CAFR we'll get the both together because I wanna make sure that it's perfectly clear the board has fully supported and approved all items stated. That would be um, concluding my report. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Anissa. We appreciate that. Any I questions from board question. members? Yes, I'm sorry. And I don't, I don't see where I can raise my hand on here. Um, so I just wanna put That's that okay. off, but. Go ahead. Um, I just have a question on the response letter and the management's response. So the auditor, the external auditor is recommending a remote access for, uh, policy and procedural document be drafted and approved by management, reviewed at least annually. The response is that there are the procedures and the process are documented. Um, and just two things that stood out for me. Um, it doesn't address that we will formally have a policy and I would support a policy for us to have in place around this. Um, but two, that we're using JIRA um, to track access requests and approvals. But my understanding of us utilizing JIRA has been primarily for the Distinguished Educators Report. And then we've had conversations that we were transitioning out of that system and looking at other um, management systems and so if i don't know who wants to respond to that but i also would like to say that the management's response does not address the action taken to have a policy in place and that is something i do believe we should have um, especially as we don't know what's going to happen the rest of 2021 or what 2022 will look like with online learning um, I know that I see that Glenn is on. Can I answer first or do you want to answer first, Glenn? Please go ahead and then I'll jump in. Okay, great. So when um, we had a very detailed meeting with the external auditors and their uh, technology team and we went through and really discussed what we were looking, what they were looking for in this particular recommendation. And while they did use the uh, term policy, they're specifically really talking about management's actions and how we're act, um, performing these protocols because they're really looking for management approval, et cetera, just to ensure that we're regularly updating and we're formally documenting. Certainly the board can decide or not decide whether or not a policy will take place, but the term policy, I know frequently inside of the district when we sometimes people will say policy and when the intent is management's action and formal approval, whereas at the district policies can only be written by the board. So certainly if the board's desire is to have some overarching uh, protocol, a policy for that, that is fine. But when we spoke with the external auditor, it was really very specific to operating management being very clear and formalizing um, in writing what it is that they would have to do. So that is the reason why we didn't specify these answers and responses. We actually went through with, with uh, the external auditor, which they accepted. 
Um, but certainly if the board's desire is to formalize a policy, I know that there was a lot of work historically going on to identify and only to approve formal policies or the more common policies. Um, there would sometimes be changes that would happen on the operating side to address this. Nevertheless, that addresses that item. Um, the secondary point is, as we were dealing with JIRA, the JIRA is frequently used by the IT organization um, for trouble ticketing, and I will pitch over to Glenn to talk about how that system's used and the functionality. We had an additional use when we were tracking the um, DE report was one of the things we used JIRA for, which was a system we had already had, and also as we were looking at um, what the monitor's doing. But uh, Glenn, do you want to just speak to what JIRA is? Thank you very much for um, filling that part in. Yes, using JIRA as part of the DE report was only a small subset of what we use the entire system for. If you ever go into Rock Connect and fill out a help desk ticket, that whole system in the back end runs off of JIRA. So we were trying to utilize systems we already had in place um, to help support the Distinguished Educators Report. You're muted. Commissioner LeBron. Yeah, no, I was like, give me one second. I was trying to find the unmute button on my thing. Um, I guess for me then, Anissa, the problem I have is that you're uploading this to the state website and you're not going to be able to give that explanation anytime someone looks at this and looks at the word policy and the intentionality um, explanation is not always going to be um, really feasible for you to do to anybody who picks this up. And for me, anything that we have in writing that's documented, um, the intentionality should be obvious and people should be able to read documents and understand exactly what we mean, what we say and how that relates um, by the intentionality of the words that we're using. And they use the word policy. Um, so I would be more comfortable if they would be willing to change the word policy to just include um, procedural provisionings and that it's reviewed annually. Um, uh, other than that, I will not, you know, that's this is the will of the board. I won't support it as written because none of us are going to be able to sit there every single time anybody looks this up at any given year and figure out that at one, that this year the auditor meant procedural um, in writing versus policy. So what I would recommend or prefer, would uh, hope to uh, be able to do is I can actually formalize in a formal document. This management letter has been issued and was provided to the board back on the 8th. The reason why I'm representing it was only so that I can have the resolution to note or acknowledge that the board had formally received it. But what I can do is document a formal memo and get acknowledgement from the external auditors of their intent and upload that as well to the system because this is due on the 15th. Would that suffice? I can't hear you, Commissioner LeBron. Yeah, that would suffice. And I would like a copy of it too. Absolutely, I'll, send it. I'll also send a copy to the board, no issue whatsoever. I see uh, Commissioner Powell's hand. Thank you. Um, um, since Rahima is also on the call uh, for, our, for our policy committee later today, um, I'm perfectly happy as chair of the policy committee to explore policy on the topic of remote access. Um, it could be very simple and refer to superintendent's regulations. Um, I have no problem with uh, exploring that as a possibility uh, and having something in place by the end of our fiscal year. Okay, so then what I can do is identify that the board is exploring it in this particular memo in state that we would be adding a policy and, ident and, and perhaps then um, add to this particular comment. My concern is the external auditor on the 8th presented this to the board and it was accepted so that I can provide this clarifying language in our letter to the state and also present that to our external auditor to know our additional actions. Would that suffice? Great, Commissioner. Any further questions or comments for Anissa? Yes, I, I have ahead, a question. Isn't it normal practice that once the management responds to the letter that the auditors accept the management responses? And it seems like that would suffice uh, in both cases, the fact that the auditors indicate that the response is satisfactory to what they, uh, their recommendation is. 
Correct. So this was actually included in their letter to the board and they did accept this response, but to recognize the concern surrounding the term policy, I have no concern with putting an additional memo together to identify that the board is both exploring the policy in addition to the items presented and ensure that our external auditors are aware of our desire to also create a policy to support this item as well. Right. Is everyone satisfied? I can't hear you, Commissioner LeBron. Okay, <laughs> great. I'm all Any set, other? President White. All right, thank you very much. We'll be uh, voting uh, later on resolution 600 and we also have resolution 599 uh, later on the board meeting. Um, I did get a, a call from our clerk indicating that the superintendent um, wish to provide the board an update on the first day of, of school opening. And I believe that it would be appropriate unless there's some objection to have that report now. So in the event that any members of the public that are watching uh, could see it early on in um, this board's meeting rather than wait until uh, towards the end after the committee meeting. So unless there's some objection, um, Superintendent Myers-Small, please uh, give us the good news on today's opening. Thank you, President White. Good evening. Good evening, Vice President Elliott, and certainly congratulations to two of you for being reelected to your offices. Good evening to the commissioners, the board staff, and Dr. Jallo, as well as, as my staff and the public. Today in the Rochester City School District was complete joy. Being in multiple buildings throughout the day, we heard things like best day ever complete breath of fresh air. I've been waiting for this day for so long. I'm so excited. Thank you for letting us come back or having us come back. And that was both on the student side as well as our staff side. Every principal was well prepared for today. Um, really, and then behind the curtain was Mike Schmidt, our chief of operations, and all of his staff, too many to number by rank and file, but today was incredible. There were more smiles, much laughter. It was very, it was an incredibly uh, joyful day um, for our students and for our staff. Um, we had students, uh, when I engaged, said things like, you know what? I've been waiting for this. This is so exciting to me. I am so happy to be back to school. And while I recognize that individuals in our community may be concerned or fearful, um, today, um, based on the conversations that I've had multiple times with medical professionals, including Dr. Mendoza, Dr. Shipley, and others, schools, are the safest place for our children to be. And so today really was an example of so much hard work, so much dedication and so much passion to make sure that that happened. People were really overjoyed to be back. So President White, Vice President Elliott and other board commissioners, thank you for being supportive of our phase plan to get certainly first back our most vulnerable students who indicated their need. Um, I think a big concern that many people have is uh, will our students be able to mask? <laughs> Almost all of our students had masks on. I saw them off for like mask breaks or for eating food, but our students really rose to the occasion. Today was amazing. And I'm a, I'm a little emotional about it because it was so amazing. One of the things that I think you know about me as superintendent is that I get extreme joy when I have the opportunity to see my students in person. And that happened today. It was really an amazing day. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to give a brief update on how today played out. Thank you. Any questions for the superintendent or comments? Um, uh, Commissioner I Powell has her hand up, it looks like. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Powell. Thank you, um, Madam Superintendent. Um, with regard to the speaker's concern about um, visitors to the school uh, from central office not, um, not maintaining social distancing amongst themselves, um, I, I, I relating back to my experiences 
uh, in, on active duty military where there were certain occasions where everyone understood that the, anyone was entitled to correct anyone else, regardless of rank, for instance, if their uniform was wrong or uh, some, something along those lines. Um, would it be possible or, or practical to put out a reminder that, that anyone can correct anyone, uh, regardless of their, their rank or, or, or uh, uh, job title um, when it comes to social distancing and, and other COVID protocols without fear of retaliation? Uh, with all due respect, Commissioner Powell, I, I was actually very offended by that comment that the speaker made. Um, and certainly, yep, there it, we all have a responsibility to remind one another. So it's certainly not about rank and file. Um, it was very important for us to get out. We are not visitors. We are part of the school district community and needed to be in each one of those schools. But certainly, yes, we need to communicate with one another. And if there are our problems, but you know what? Today was an exciting day and it was a unique day in that it was our first day of school. So did maybe uh, two of our, you know, our team maybe walked in close together rather than six feet apart? Sure, there were times that students were closer than they should be. This is not a perfect science. This is our first day of being involved in in-person learning and to comment that central office, um, was uh, in violation of social distancing. Certainly we wanna make sure that we are safe, that we are masking. The, the most important thing, if you look at the research though, is also making sure that you are masked, which everyone was. Um, but were, were we perfectly six feet apart at all times? No one was today. We will get there, um, but with all due respect, absolutely people can share. There shouldn't be a fear to be able to address it. But today was a joyful day and to start comments like that, I think is very disheartening for me as the superintendent. Thank you. I appreciate your, your emotional response and I really wasn't referring, I, I wasn't raising that as a detraction from your point. I, I, what I really wanted to get to though is, is um, communicating to the entire district community that, that anyone should feel without any sense of a fear of retaliation, uh, reminders, gentle reminders, uh, um, respectful reminders, but reminders nevertheless of, of what's right because it, just as you say, it was an exciting emotional time and, and um, those are exactly the times when we often forget, especially new rules. We, we remember the rules we grew up with, but we don't always remember the new rules. And I, I'm just suggesting, uh, without taking anything away from your presentation, um, that um, it's possible that, that people felt intimidated and unwilling to give a reminder, gentle or respectful or otherwise, out of fear of the rank difference between um, those who came, you know, who, who are, are um, we'll say, native to the building versus folks coming in from the outside. I certainly hope not, but absolutely. We need to all be co-partners in making sure that we stay safe and that we observe the protocols. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. Thank you, Superintendent Myers. I see Commissioner, El Vice President Elliott, and then Commissioner LeBron. Yeah, I, you know, um, uh, Dr. Maya Smalls, you know, I didn't vote in favor of this, but, um, you know, because of the disproportionate uh, health issues that happen in, in the African-American and the Latino, and Latino community. But I was so excited to hear how well um, that it went uh, with, the, with the students and with the teachers and just, you know, the, the students wanted to be around um, their friends. <clears throat> you know, I have some, some reservations. Um, but I, I'd also like to echo, this is not the time to add all this criticism. This is a time to work on getting this correct. Are there going to be mistakes? Absolutely, because we have not been here before. And so for people to come and want to criticize this process, as opposed to wanting to help 
to participate in making it right and give us some latitude when there is uh, when when there may be some things that are wrong. Uh, we, we don't have time for that in this district. And um, if you want to do the right thing by our students, if you want to be a a a um, a participant in this work, given that we're going to make mistakes, given that we may make mistakes, um, participate in this and help us to do the better, the, the right thing, not be critical of this. I, 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 I too, Dr. Meyer Small, take exception to what was said, and you have my full support, even though I didn't vote in favor of this. Um, this time out for this foolishness. Time out for that. We got to do the right thing by our children and we got to make sure that they get educated, whatever kind of design that we use. So thank you, um, Madam Superintendent. Commissioner LeBron. Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, I guess for me, I would like to also, Dr. Myers, request a formal presentation on what um, school opening for February is also going to look like. Um, cause I am hearing different things and I'm just trying to understand how teachers are expected to, I guess right now I thought I had the understanding that teachers would be teaching two days hybrid in person and then teaching those same group of kids who are in person the other two days virtually. But I'm also hearing different feedback that some teachers are expected to teach hybrid and virtually at the same time. And I just, I guess I just want clarification from you as a superintendent in a formal presentation so that all parents, community, and teachers are all on the same page with the understanding of how this model looks like. Um, because if it's the other model, like I don't think that makes too much sense, but we can have those conversations at another time. Um, the other piece I just want to mention what was just brought up. Um, I do think it's a realistic fear that employees have that if someone is an anti-masker um, or does not want to wear a mask, what are going to be mm -hmm. um, the protocols for them to address it. And I will say it, it, it can't be a gentle reminder sometimes because some people don't want to hear it. And so I, I'm looking for what processes and procedures the district is going to put in place to ensure that mm -hmm. our staff are following masking um, requirements. And also if you can, when you give the presentation, just give clarity both to parents and to this community on what the expectation is around masking. That would be great because I think there is some confusion um, some of the feedback I've seen is that the language and the manuals that we've presented and put out there are not strong enough. But I also know like the CDC and everyone's being asked to wear a mask anytime we're interacting in any kind of public setting. But I think it would be beneficial if we also took a strong approach and understanding that we are requiring masks. Very few people will have exemptions. It will have to be strongly medically documented and the school will have to accept those medical documentations and noted. And, you know, I just want us to be very clear because I know that there is a lot of fears um, and, and I think we can do as much as we can do to alleviate those fears by providing the information directly from you as the superintendent. Mm -hmm. Dr. Myers, you want to respond to that at all or, or just wait for a more formal presentation that Commissioner LeBron has requested? Well, we um, are looking to come forward in um, Dr. Morris, Dr. Black and I um, on Tuesday during ESA to give some updates to, pro to provide clarity because, you know, the instructional frame, that's what we're talking about as far as getting into classrooms. So that's the goal is to have it there. I'm looking at the participant list and I don't see any other hands being raised. I, I did want to add There's my own. There's one from uh, Commissioner Elliott, Vice President Elliott. Oh, I, that, she must have just raised it. I'm sorry, Vice President Elliott, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to, you know, reiterate that, you know, th this is, we are all learning this, in this process. Um, it, it's very important for people to understand you know, not to come out and be critical. And certainly, you know, we could do things better. This is the first day. But, but, but to come out and be that critical of the superintendent, of her staff, I, I think that's unfair. I, I think we've got to wait until 
things sort of flush out, if you will, to see where we need to put the um, some 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 improvements in place. Give us time to be able to do that. There are options where if you don't want if if, if children if our parents don't want our children in school we've got you know alternatives for that and i understand that there may be fear um then then we may not need to have uh those children those students in school um but there are students that want to be in school there there are uh staff that want to be in school so we have to make allowances for that and so again i will put on the record to come out and to be critical and first and also for the first day even in, even when it's not COVID, when we do a first day, things don't work out correctly. So give give let's give uh, the superintendent and her staff some latitude behind this. Let's not get political about this, but let's just make sure that we are trying to do the best that we can do for the students in the Rochester City School District. And they're going. There probably will be some mistakes. Give us allowances. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to look at the participant list to make sure that everybody's had a chance to offer uh, their opinion on the matter. I, I did want to note. Van, I'm um, sorry, I have my hand up again. Oh, I, I don't know why it's not rich. I'm using my cell phone to let you folks know because. So I think Zoom had an update because I see hands now on the corners and I had to look somewhere else to raise the hand. At least my Zoom had an update. I don't know if that looks like that. Yeah. For you. Before you go on, Commissioner LeBron, just so that this doesn't continue to happen because it happened with Vice President Elliott as well. Uh, question, Tom, you can text me. For some reason, if people raise their hands, it's, it's registering late and I'm not seeing it. Now we can work around that. People could just say, hey, Van, I raised my hand. But if maybe could someone explain to me why that's happening? But go ahead, Commissioner LeBron. Yeah, no, I just want to, you know, just reinforce what my comments were not, per, my comments, you know, I just want to say my comments were not critical of Dr. Myers. And, you know, I support her too. But I do want to acknowledge, you know, I guess for me, I'm a realist and I want to. I want to acknowledge that these are real conversations that people have and fears and things that are happening. Um, the other piece, though, um, that I forgot to mention, and I try to write notes to myself so I, don't, so I don't forget points, is that, you know, when school is normally in session as a board member, I do try to go out to all of my schools and make school visits. But I do want to encourage all of my colleagues to do that, especially during this time. If we're asking staff to be in buildings and we're opening for students, we should also be masked up and um, showing our support to the schools that we're liaisons for. But I also want to just let Leslie and her team know that I will be doing school visits. Um, and I am looking at my calendar now to start those visits, hopefully by the end of January, but certainly by February, um, have a plan to make it through all of the buildings on the liaison for um, and continue to do those on the regular for the rest of the year. But just to give you a heads up. And that was it. Thanks, Van. Thank you. Um, again, I'm, I'm looking at my participant screen, re reminding you all that I'm using my cell phone. So it could be something technical from my end. I've been having computer problems all day. I'm going to stay at the screen just for a few more seconds to make sure nobody raises their hand. And then I have to switch off of it so that I can uh, make my comments. So uh, I appreciate it. If, if I miss you, just say, hey, Van, I, I got my hand raised. Um, Commissioner, I mean, Superintendent uh, Myers Small. I want to say to you and to all of uh, my colleagues and everybody listening, um, there, it, without sounding harsh or judgmental, there is this thing called the First Amendment. We're educators. We yeah. are principally responsible for educating children. Then in the United States of America, you can speak your mind and, and, and you should be able to do that, whatever your perspective. And, and not to mention, we have bylaws that reserve the right of citizens to come and articulate what is on their mind. We risk jeopardizing, respectfully, we risk jeopardizing our posture as educators if people can't come on and make their comments as they observe them. I, like Commissioner Elliott, disagree, and others, I assume, uh, that, well, let me say, I agree with Commissioner Elliott, that Vice President Elliott, that we need to make allowances. And I think a number of people said that. Mistakes are gonna happen. I myself have probably violated CDC regulations regarding COVID countless times. And sometimes I realize it, and sometimes people have to remind me of it. But let me go back to our bylaws in the First Amendment. They, they preserve for citizens of this country and our bylaws for 
uh, people of this community the right to take that podium and say what they need to say. And, and let us not forget, we had a distinguished educator that told us, for whatever reason, that there is an environment that makes people feel like they can't speak their mind. Uh, so I would just really encourage people to, to, to be indulgent of people coming to the podium and saying what they feel they need to say. It has been said a number of times tonight and many times before, this is a new experience for everybody. And people make mistakes. People do things that maybe in hindsight they would or they wouldn't do, including maybe those staff people that she saw, maybe, maybe standing close to each other, including, uh, and I, I, I don't want to call it a name, Ms. Labrosa, maybe she's experiencing something new and different and doesn't know when and how to articulate it. So the indulgence and the patience that we ask for from others, we should be willing, particularly given the fact that we have a First Amendment that says they have the right to provide them that kind of indulgence and patience because they too are experiencing something new for the very first time. And again, uh, it bears worth repeating, the United States Constitution says they have that right. Our bylaws give them that right. The other thing that I will say, and I said it to you privately, uh, Superintendent, uh, and, and I would concur with Commissioner LeBron, nothing I say, uh, I hope would be construed as, and I know you wouldn't take it this way, Leslie, as not being supportive of you. I, I don't feel even a need to say that, but um, we all should be reminded that you have seven board members that support you. And one of the things that we talked about this morning in our officers meeting was that we both coincidentally love a particular quote by Martin Luther King, wherein he said, the ultimate measure of man is not where he stands at moments of comfort and convenience, but rather where he stands at moments of challenge and controversy. Mm -hmm. you, are, you and your staff are in a very challenging, controversial time. And, 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 and to turn this particular controversy into a compliment, let me say, as I said to you privately today, you have handled this controversy, this challenge, in a way that would make any leader proud because you've had to make some decisions that were not easy. Some decisions, as we've heard tonight, and let me just say, Ms. Labrosa is not alone. There are a lot of people that maybe share her point of view, which we should allow for. But remember this, Ms. Labrosa, and I know she knows this because she's an educator, that our superintendent and Vice President Elliott and myself and everybody in this country, in the state and the city, also has a First Amendment right, I'm sure Ms. Labrosa appreciates this, to say what uh, Superintendent Meyer said in response to that. Ms. Labrosa may not agree with the, uh, what the superintendent said, but our superintendent, Vice President Elliott, myself, and the thousands of people that work for this district, and the parents, the hundreds of thousands of parents and loved ones that support these children, also have the right to have a certain point of view about what Ms. Labrosa said and to articulate that without any reprimand or repercussions. Our superintendent has no intention of dealing with our staff in that way, but how the First Amendment works is, she has the right, Ms. Labrosa has the right to say what she said, and our superintendent and Vice President Elliott, et cetera, have the right to say what they say without anybody casting judgment or saying, you shouldn't say that because it could be harmful. What would be harmful is if we had an environment where people could not speak under the First Amendment, if we had an environment that said, our bylaws say you can stand and take that podium for three minutes, but yet don't say things that we don't want you to say. We, we can't have that as a district. And I'm glad to say, in the years that I've been on the Board of Education, that's not the kind of Board of Education or the superintendents that we've had. So uh, well, let me I, just I, say this, uh, because I feel like that was a reprimand. And I, I reprimand. reject that as, as a reprimand. Um, she, you know, we all have a right. Um, she, we do, she did not, we did not violate her uh, First Amendment rights. But this is a different time, Van, and we've got to make sure that we all are trying to be on the same page as we can. To say that, um, that she can't be critical, uh, I'm not saying that, but at the same time, because these are different times, this is about life and death. This, ain't, this is not the time to, um, to, to, to not be able to try to work this thing together. And that's where my comments come from. Yes, she had some comments, but at the same time, we're trying to make sure we're doing the best we can. We haven't been this way before. So I'm not, it's not about her First Amendment rights. She has the right to say what she has to say. But at the same time, as I said, these are different times. You know, we've got to work together. That's where my conversation was coming from. 
We've got to work together. We, we can't, in my view, we can't expend energy on this. It doesn't work for us. Other than, you know, we're going to try to do better. And I know Commissioner LeBron talked about that, you know, but let's try to work this thing together. We, we don't have time. As I said, and I'll say it again, we don't have time for the foolishness. Thank you. Well, let me just say, uh, Vice President Elliott, it was not a reprimand. It was my opinion on how we should, as you say, work together collectively. All right, I'll accept that. I, 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 I just think one of the ways that we can work together collectively is accepting, as you and I have done over many years, accepting the fact that sometimes people are gonna disagree with what we have to say. That is what we, you and I have done for many years. That is what our bylaws require and that's what our constitution allows for. So I, I'm not trying to engage in any controversy with anybody here. And in fact, I'm trying to, uh, as Dr. King would say, lead in a very controversial, as you would say, challenging time um, with a level of uh, integrity that allows for people to say what they need to say. Both you, me, Ms. Labrosa, and the superintendent. That's that's all. Uh, and and actually, we've, we've allowed for that. Yeah, yeah. All okay. Right. All right. Next item on the agenda is uh, let's see. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank again the superintendent for for that update. It was a much um, next item on our agenda is the the. Um, Acting Chief of Special Education, Ms. Richmond and uh, Ms. Martinez are going to give us a report on the CPSE uh, report. Is that right, Superintendent? I have uh, Ms. Richmond and Ms. Martinez giving the board an update on the CSE. Yes, good evening. Yeah. Yep, I'm here. Um, good evening, President White and Vice President Elliott and Commissioners. Uh, this evening, you're going to be reviewing Resolution 599, but uh, accompanying that is my executive summary that talks about uh, the meetings that were held during the month of November for the board's approval. Um, in accordance with Part 200.2D of the Commissioner's Regulation for Students with Disabilities, the board uh, will need to approve the services for students with disabilities based on the meetings that were held during uh, the month. This is a standing item on uh, the board uh, in, in the future going forward. Um, and I wanted to know if anyone had any questions about my summary or the board report that was attached. Okay, let me go to the participant screen. Give me a second. I do see Commissioner LeBron has raised her hand. Yes, um, thank you. Just two um, questions for you. Um, one of them is is moving forward in the memo that you prepared for us, this one, the one pager. If you can add a line just referencing the resolution and the number that is going to be accompanying it, that way, I'm just again, an individual that likes to think of anybody who sees it can go back and reference that it was actually attached to a resolution and then that way we know that the resolution came before the board and we have documentation that it was officially voted on and so just that small note and then just a question on how these meetings are being held um, during COVID and that that's just been a lingering question on how CSD meetings um, are being held during COVID and how parents are being notified and and, and so forth. Okay so all of the uh, meetings are being held through Zoom, they're remote. Um, I will say we um, are happy to report that because we are using uh, Zoom and remote meetings that our parent participation is, is up. It's like it's doubled. It, it's very good news and it's something that we've said, wow, we should continue doing this, um, allowing families to participate this way. It, cuts down on childcare, cuts down on transportation issues. So we're really happy that that's um, happening. Um, the second part of your question, uh, say that again, I'm sorry. No, it was okay. It was just to add a line that references the- Oh, no, I, ha I have that. It. Yeah, that was it. That. No, but they, they've been going well. And um, you know we're sharing documents either electronically um, or mailing them to parents. And uh, right now it's, it's working well. Um, we're, we're happy to um, continue to 
to operate this way. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Commissioner LeBron. Uh, Dr. Jallo, I see you've raised your hand. You're, you're muted. You're muted. Muted, Dr. Jallo. Can you tell us, good evening, everyone. Could you tell us a little bit more about what these numbers mean? What, what, what are these numbers telling us? Um, are they high? Are they low? What should we compare them to? Are there any numbers or data points that we should be concerned about? You know, because the numbers are just here in isolation. So it's hard to understand the relevance of those numbers. Are you talking about the summary or the actual board report? The summary. Okay, the summary is just basically that's what it is. It's a summary of all those meetings that are attached uh, to the report, which there's 340 something pages because it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it actually goes by meeting, by meeting, by meeting. So this is really just a summary of how many annual review meetings were held, and there are about a little over a thousand. And uh, I have already run numbers for December, and we're averaging about a thousand meetings per month so far for the two months that I've I've done them. Um, and it, it just an annual review when we had how many reevaluations of of those 1,059 meetings, what category did they fall into? What type of meeting uh, was held? Um, that's what the summary is. And how many were uh, initial eligibility outcomes um, and how many did we declassify? So it's just a summary of, of the report that's attached. Okay. I, I, I guess I'm just trying to understand the relevance. How many, how many special, how many students do we have with IEPs? So maybe I just need something to compare it to because it's sure. not grounded in anything for me. Like yeah, how many students, like how do we know that it, a thousand a month is a good but it's taken, it's taken directly from Frontline, that is our management system. So we can, this report is run directly through um, actual numbers. That are that are happening. We have close to six thousand uh, students with disabilities in the district. Um, that includes um, students placed in external um, placements, external okay. education as well. Thank you. You all set, Dr. Jello? Take that silence as a yes, Commissioner Powell. Thank you. Um, so it's no secret that the board and, and myself in particular are concerned about the category of other health, uh, o, o, what is it, OH? Other health impaired, yes. Uh, HI impaired. Mm -hmm. Well, the issue is um, even, if I, even when I go through the 323 pages, um, those pages identify the services provided, but it doesn't tell us if the if we're going in the right direction with regard to this particular problem uh, classification, which which I and many others believe is too high. Um, you know, because without knowing anything about the individual students, like how can that many people have? And, and children not fit into uh, an existing classification. So I think it would be helpful for me, this being sort of the first time we're seeing an executive summary, that, that we um, um, be provided with information on uh, uh, what, the, what the classification, for those that are doing annual reviews, uh, and initial eligibilities, uh, what was their, um, what was the classification outcome? And, and then be some mechanism, table, chart, what have you, that indicates like the before the meetings and then after the meetings when it's an annual review, you know? Are, are, are the, are those OHIs getting declassified? Are they getting, be, being given a, a more appropriate classification. Um, you know, there's, I don't know how else with in an, in an, an, an irregular monthly report we'll be able to get a grip on this problem category if we're not, if we're not able to see, you know, 
um, what's happening in those meetings. Do you follow me? Yes, um, I can provide you with a disability category chart um, if you'd like. Um, so of those 6,087 students that we have that are classified currently, um, I, I, I have a breakdown by disability category. So I can provide that in the future if you want that as a summary of each monthly report. Well, in particular, what I'm looking to see is, you know, how can, how can we demonstrate that we're weaning ourselves off of this inappropriate use of OHI as a classification? You know, uh, so looking at uh, the student's classification uh, before annual review and then after to see, you know, to see what changed um, would perhaps be helpful. It, it probably is more likely to happen. A classification change can happen at any time, but most likely it happens after a reevaluation meeting where new assessments are completed. Um, so I can uh, try to put that uh, together with, you know, with my team. Okay, that's, that's a, looking at your summary, that's a fairly small percentage of the overall. Um, and how often are reevaluations done? Clearly not, well. Reevaluations re are mandated every three years. However, one could be requested yearly, but only one. Uh, but for the most part, they're done um, every three years. They're completed then. Okay. So in any event, weaning ourselves off of this particular classification is going to take time. And from a, from a board oversight perspective, I guess we just need, we need to be able to see that progression. So however you deem it useful in your reporting on the summary, uh, on the executive summary, um, you know, I, I do trust your judgment. It, it understand, since you're under, clearly by your body language, you understand. Sure. What the <laughs> I, I, I completely understand. <laughs> um, just so you know, too, um, that is something I have noticed, like, so our other health impaired or OHI classification and our learning disability classification, they're about even. Um, so we are, as a team, taking a look at the other health impaired classification and working with uh, the central CSE team because they provide the initial classification, you know, title from, from that point on and, you know, taking a look at working with them to say, why are they choosing that? And we are dissecting that. We're, we're taking a look at that uh, more and more, but um, other health impairment, you know, a detention deficit falls under there, under that classification. So you can imagine. Um, but it had its own category. It was added um, not too long ago. So I think that's why you might've seen uh, somewhat of an increase in that classification rate. Uh, but there are, and it depends on how it's impacting the student's performance in the classroom. So right, well, let's break those well, numbers down for you. Yeah, that, that last point is why even looking at 323 pages, I wasn't able to tell right. what, what was the movement in this category because we're only looking at the remedies that we're providing. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. Commissioner Clark? Yes, in reviewing the report, I had a couple of questions. You indicated that the, uh, the parent participation has doubled as a result of going online. And my first question was, what percentage per month of parents actually um, participate in the reports? Is it 60%, 40%? And I can get you that number. Um, okay. I want to be more exact, but I know from talking to my team, they said it's drastically increased. But we can definitely, there are by parent attendance listed on uh, the individualized education program and in the minutes of the meeting and the, there's an attendance record for every meeting. We can, we can pull that, that out and provide that to you. And my second question was, what role does parents play in the finalization of the IEP? I mean, are, 
are they provided uh, a lot of input or is the plan put together and then presented to the parents? And also do the parents have the, uh, how often can they request a reevaluation? How often can they request a reevaluation? Parents, yes. Once, once per year. Okay. If they want most often though, um, it is every three years. And you know, sometimes a reevaluation doesn't have to be a whole thing. Maybe a parent just wants one area checked. As far as parent engagement, it's very important to the process. Um, and engagement is, is critical. And we do have our associate directors, teachers reaching out to families. We make at least uh, three contacts to ensure parent participation. If we don't hear the first time, we call again and then a, a third time. Um, and we, we really want them involved there. And we certainly want to provide them with information on um, the format of the meetings, how the meeting is run, what information they can uh, add. And in every document, in every section of the academic sections of the IEP and social emotional, there's actually a section called parent concern. And so we need to address that at the meetings and even before so, you sh hopefully you have that relationship, right? And we put that together uh, for the families and that's addressed in the actual document. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Clark. Um, I, I just wanna note that um, this uh, process that we're undergoing right now which is going to be a monthly presentation. Isn't that right, uh, Superintendent Meyer Small? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I just wanna note that in my observation, I think this might be one of the most significant uh, change uh, deal breakers or, or what's the phrase that I'm looking for? I, I think this process of bringing this before the board on a monthly basis could be a very significant could have a very significant impact on our ability to uh, improve in the area of special education. Never before has the Board of Education received regular reports from central office with respect to what is happening in special education. We've received annual reports, crises reports. Uh, the last one was by Dr. Judy Elliott. Uh, there was another one before that, but those come like every three years or four years when somebody's upset at what we've done. But in addition to the special education committee that was chaired by uh, former Commissioner Funches, I, I think that at the end of 2021, we will probably think this is probably one of the more significant uh, systemic changes that the Board of Education is engaged in in order to monitor on a regular basis what is happening to our special needs students. We've never had this before and I, I, I am encouraged by this, not only because the, the superintendent is providing this report on, on the regular, but also in light of the questions that uh, and comments that my colleagues have made, uh, Dr. Jallo, uh, Commissioner LeBron, Commissioner Powell, and Commissioner Clark have all offered commentary or questions or suggestions that will make this report, I think, very useful as we sort of monitor through 2021 what is happening to our most vulnerable students, particularly uh, during this COVID crisis. So I wanna thank uh, Ms. Richmond and Ms. Martinez for uh, following the direction of the superintendent, identifying this as a area that we uh, needed to comply with. But in the end, I think it's really gonna go way beyond compliance. I think it's gonna inform the board about what's happening uh, to our special needs students. Uh, Vice President Elliott. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I recall, and I, I want to know at this point, how much authority uh, does the CSE um, committee carry? And the reason I bring that up, because earlier in my tenure on the board, uh, there was a parent who reached out to me whose uh, child uh, had some emotional issues. And to the point where he was a pretty big kid, I think he probably weighed about 400 pounds or so. And so the issue was, is that, and there were a number of people, even people who were not district staff, but other professionals, she did not want to give the child um, 
extra, didn't want the child to have extra food. But the professionals um, made the decision that they will give the child what the child wants. Now, I'm in the meeting with her. They have no respect for me and they said to me that they were going to give that child whatever that child asked for. I'm telling you from what I heard, not from, from what I know, not from what I heard, I'm in the room. And so, unfortunately, the parent died. And, and this, this parent had been very involved with the um, academic success of her child, but I think he had some, some emo and I can't remember the details. I guess my concern is, is that the, this committee had more authority than the parent, that they did not listen to the parent, nor did they have any respect for me as being there as an advocate for the parent. And as I said, the parent ended up dying. So how much authority uh, does this committee have? And, and who, who is the um, next uh, step of authority uh, in this kind of situation? So when it comes to, and I'm sorry that someone experienced that because that's not how a CSE meeting should be run. Um, it's a collaborative process. Uh, parent input is very valuable and should be considered. Um, ultimately, the chairperson does have to come to a decision and we always try to reach consensus. However, every parent has a due process rights. Okay, they, they could ask for another meeting, they could ask for someone else, they could, they could say, I don't agree, and there's an entire due process uh, rights, pro an actual process that they can, they can go through to resolve any issues. Um, you know, we want it to be collaborative. We want it to be uh, where parents are engaged in the process, um, but someone does have to make a decision but you hope that there's consensus that that's made, you know, with, with the group. So the, the authority is with Question. this committee. At the, at, the, at the end of the day, what you're saying to me is that the, the authority is with this committee. The chairperson of the committee has, has to bring closure to the committee meeting, but hopefully it's in conjunction with the family, with, with the team members, right? Because you have a special education teacher, a general education teacher, you have the parent, you have the chairperson, you might have some related service providers there. Um, and hopefully they come to consensus and in their decision. Um, but there's always, there's always gonna be someone that disagrees from time to time and we wanna address those. Spe certainly they could go to the, one of the directors, they could come to the chief, we could look at things, sit down and try. I've done that many times. Well, I, I'm not that satisfied with your answer. I understand it because it leaves the parent with seemingly no authority and no recourse, you know. Um, and, and in this case, you know, they were asking, they did not manage this process correctly in this because the child weighed like 400 pounds. The parent was asking, don't give him anything to eat. They made the decision that because the child wanted it, they were going to uh, do, make their decision based on what the child wanted. So they ignored the, um, they ignored what the parent wanted. And that's just unfortunate. So I bring this, I want this on the table so that as we move forward with these CSE committees, that parents are, a, a, a significant um, part of this process. In fact, you know, we should be in many regards, this was an involved parent. It's not some, you know, not a parent that is not involved. This was an involved parent, you know. So thank you. Sure. Thank you, Vice President. Any other questions or comments uh, for um, the administration on this particular topic? We are of course gonna be voting on that resolution in just a few moments. Uh, I do want to do a time check. Um, our agenda uh, says that uh, governance was to begin at 6.30. Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, but I'm sure we'll do fine. Um, any other questions or comments for Ms. Richmond or for the superintendent? Um, Van, I just wanted to quickly say yep. thank you for the sure. presentation and, and the work that you've done. So thank you very much. Yep. Oh, thank you.
Ex yes, excellent work. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, we look forward to uh, your next uh, report. Um, again, I'm sure it might be tweaked a bit based on maybe some of the comments that you heard today. Uh, it's a, we assume it's a living, breathing document and every time it, it, get, it comes before us in a meeting, we'll maybe see something a little bit different and, and that's okay. All right, um, let's move on then to the consideration of resolutions. I need a motion to approve resolution 599 uh, which was just discussed. Uh, is there a motion? Motion. Thank okay. you, Commissioner Loy. Is a second? I think I heard second. Commissioner Clark. Uh, I think I heard Commissioner Clark first. Yes, you did. Um, all right. Uh, there's been a motion and a second. Uh, any questions or comments regarding Resolution 599? Let me look on my participant screen here. I don't see any, so let's go ahead and vote. All those in favor of Resolution 599, indicate by turning on your video monitor and by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? Seems that the ayes have it, Madam Clerk. Next uh, resolution up for consideration is resolution 600. Is there a motion? A motion. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. And I think I heard it seconded by Commissioner Clark. Yes. Any, thank you. Any questions or comments regarding resolution 600, which was discussed earlier today? Looking at my participant screen, I don't see anybody raising their hand. So we'll go ahead and take a vote on resolution 600. All those in favor of Resolution 600, indicate by uh, turning on your video screen and saying aye. 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 Any opposition? And Madam Clerk, unless uh, I've missed something, it seems like the ayes have that as well. Next item on the agenda is the Governance Committee report. So I uh, graciously and confidently turn over the gavel to Commissioner uh, Amy Malloy, Chair of Governance. Great, thank you. Um, and just a quick question. Uh, oh, good evening, everybody. Uh, just a quick question for Kalia. It says consideration of minutes. Uh, do we have minutes to consider this evening? There are minutes to consider, but for policy tonight. So it will be in the policy meeting. All right. Thank you. I was just, uh, just wondering that. All right. So uh, thank you to, to everyone. Um, and just wanted to say good evening to Dr. Meyer Small, Dr. Jallo, um, all of our executive cabinet members, and my fellow board members. Um, and also those of you from the community who are listening in. Um, I'm going to quickly just give an overview of the purpose of our governance committee. Uh, board governance deals directly with our board oversight or simply put how we conduct ourselves um, and monitor our conduct as um, board members um, and how we interact with one another in order to uh, determine all of our collective needs uh, we coordinate training to enhance our ability to perform our roles as commissioners. And we're also responsible for maintaining an effective and working relationship with our superintendent. And kudos to our superintendent for all the work that you have done. Um, you have uh, some near insurmountable challenges that you face. Um, so kudos for the, the great deal of work that you and your staff have put in uh, considering the, the many voices uh, that we hear. Um, we are also in charge as a governance staff of onboarding uh, new members. And I do want to extend, extend another official congratulations to our newest board member, Mr. William Clark, who started with us in December, but who was renamed yesterday at our board organizational meeting to uh, continue uh, his term of office through December 31st of 2021. Um, I'd just like to reiterate that although you are new to our board, uh, your community expertise and experience is long established and respected. And I, for one, am really looking forward to, to learning as much as I can from you. So welcome again. Um, so forgive me for that you know, slight di digression. Um, I was reiterating the purpose of the governance committee before I went off on that little tangent. Um, in addition to welcoming um, our new board members, governance is also tasked with um, annually updating the superintendent and their evaluation tool. Um, we're in charge of supervising and evaluating our board staff and also in charge of working with board members to modify um, as necessary the board staff evaluation tool. And then finally, of course, uh, the governance committee organizes board retreats for ongoing professional development, one of which we had last night as part of our newly developed or clarified professional development calendar. Um, and we're going to continue to take input and recommendations from our state monitor, Dr. Shelley Jallo, um, to develop adequate governance policy. Um, we begin tonight's agenda with an overview 
of our onboarding policy um, relating to our new commissioners. Uh, we've made a lot of progress on this over the past few months. Uh, board staff have recently updated our 2510 policy manual and it can now be found on board docs in a digital format. Um, if you recall, it used to be housed via paper hard copy in binders uh, that were given to new commissioners. I know that's what I had along with Commissioner Adams when we first began our terms last January. So I am pleased to see our newest commissioner reaping the benefits of a digitized copy of this information. And I am looking forward to speaking to Commissioner Clark about how this digital format has worked for him so as to you know, better ascertain or reflect on, on future changes that we might need to make. So uh, Commissioner Clark, I will be reaching out to you to, uh, to gather that information as we continue our reflective practice. Um, our board clerk, uh, Calia Wade, will be providing us with an overview of some of the other progress that we've made as a committee over the past months and has pr prepared us a short in overview of, of all of this. Calia? Yes, good evening everyone uh, once more. I just wanted to go ahead and um, provide a, an update on our board or onboarding process. Uh, if you do recall, one of the recommendations um, or tasks that were given to the board um, by, um, or, uh, by um, Michelle Diallo um, had to do with updating and providing a comprehensive review of our board onboarding process. And so um, we have actually been utilizing our new member orientation policy, that's policy 2510, in order to uh, really uh, go through uh, that process. If anyone wants to look at that, our policies are posted to the website and easily available, but policy 2510 is part of the 2000 series that has to do with um, board, the board's governance section. And uh, this policy kind of delineates what needs to take place when we orient a new member. And uh, Commissioner Clark recently went through this process. So I will refer to him um, very much uh, through this. Uh, so essentially, um, we have broken down the policy into its parts. Um, the, there, are, there is an additional part um, that is not shown on screen right now, which has to do with the onboarding of our um, student leadership uh, president and a representative to the student representative to the board. So that has been left out because we are talking really about the um, board member orientation timeline. But we put together um, in governance kind of actions that have to take place um, as it relates to onboarding. The first is um, making sure that there are uh, the procedural matters that take place with our legal, legal counsel and also meetings that take place with our HCI department. That generally has to do with um, really making sure that that new member is oriented with the um, business parts of the organization and ensuring that that person gets their uh, login information, their um, access to um, a phone line and uh, to their email, et cetera. Um, so that does take place. Uh, and normally we want to ensure that that takes place within the first week um, to two weeks of appointment. And at that point also, we do have a two hour minimum uh, orientation session that is taking place with myself, as well as the rest of the board um, office staff to orient our board members to the policy manual, um, the school law handbook, um, as uh, Commissioner Malloy stated, we do now have our, our, um, our onboarding packet on our board docs. Um, and so we have been utilizing that with Commissioner Clark and we made sure that we showed him the board docs website and how he would be able to access those things. There are a few things that are still in paper form um, only because we wanna make sure that um, it's easily um, accessible. Um, but hopefully as we get closer to utilizing board docs in entirety, that new board members will be able to, to really access that more free, freely. Um, so there's also uh, some text that we want our board members to uh, really be familiar with. Um, I did mention the uh, school law book, but there's also the um, Roberts Rules text. Everyone did uh, participate in that Roberts Rules PD session yesterday with um, Council Carling. And so 
there is a text that goes with that. And I know that Commissioner Malloy will touch on that a little bit later, but we try to ensure that all board members get access to those um, Roberts rules. Um, and there's also 10 questions every school board member should ask. That is a relatively newer text um, that um, the board received PD with um, last year, and that is something that we try to um, recommend. It is not something that we provide, but we do recommend that board members do read that book because it is quite um, useful. And then we also um, ensure that board members kind of just are familiar with the website, the district's website, and um, know where to go to look for policies, etc. Um, the next thing has to do with um, meeting with myself. Um, well, Myself and, and also the executive assistant to the board, um, Francine, um, she does a really good job of going through the board's master calendar and ensuring that the board, the new, newest board member members uh, are oriented to uh, what events are coming up and ensuring also that they are quite familiar with the PD sessions that we have lined up. One of the things that we are working on is to ensure that the PD sessions every year, there are um, repeat PD sessions and then their new PD sessions. So the one on Robert's rules, we're hoping to make that an annual event where if there are any newly oriented board members, it, it, they will receive that, that um, orientation um, newly and then it will be a refresher for any um, continuing on board members. Um, the next part has to do with um, meeting with or executive cabinet. And we ensure within the first three months of appointment that the board member um, meets with the superintendent and the deputy superintendents, as well as the departmental chairs. At this point, Commissioner Clark has met with our superintendent. He is still um, slated to meet with the deputy superintendents and the departmental heads, but we are trying to do that in a very streamlined um, process. Um, and I work very closely with our uh, with or with my liaison on the administrative side, Marisol, who will be making sure that um, that is something that is um, kind of structured so that it, every board member will have the same kind of orientation with departmental heads. So for example, if a board member is newly um, oriented to the board, um, they will, and they're interested in facilities, for example, they'll have a, a presentation from the facilities department that is um, standard and all board members will have that same information when they are oriented. Um, the last part has to do with um, the mandated trainings from NISBA that the New York State School Boards Association, they have mandated trainings for all board members in New York State with regard to um, governance and fiscal oversight. And that is something that we must to do by law. And so that we have slated to take place within the first month of appointment. Commissioner Clark has um, been registered for those courses. They are nine hours each. Um, and I know all board members here should have already done those. Um, and we keep the documentation in office for that. So um, we really are working to make sure that board members are fully oriented in the process um, by following our policy, but just fleshing that out more so. Um, some additional components that we have discussed and which we'll be, um, we'll be working to include have to do with orientation meetings with board committee chairs. I know working with um, Commissioner Malloy, um, as we brainstormed what things we could do to uh, improve the orientation process, that was something that definitely came up is to ensure that newly oriented board members get a chance to meet with the board committee chairs and the parent representative to, to those committees to make sure that they know exactly what board functions are taking place. And then also in addition to meetings with board staff like myself and Rahima and Francine, um, that the board members are also oriented to the remainder of the board's departmental functions, which is uh, we do have the audit department um, led by Ms. Anissa Henry Wheeler, or Auditor General. And then we also um, have our claims audit function, which now is um, taking place with Naraki Smith um, group. And so that is something that we're working to ensure also gets added to our orientation. And then the last piece that we have been talking about as well is to include an orientation-based meeting with our advisory groups. 
the board does have quite a few advisory groups, um, the Student Advisory Council, we have the Parent Leadership Advisory Council, Special Education Advisory Council, Bilingual and Multilingual Advisory Councils. And so we're hoping to also add um, or add to the agenda of new board members um, for them to attend meetings, maybe just one meeting to orient themselves with those groups um, to ensure that they, they are familiarized with the leadership on, um, on those uh, different councils. So that is um, what our orientation looks like at this current time. But I want to also allow uh, space for persons to uh, suggest any, anything else that you would like to see reflected in the orientation. See the hands. Let's see if participant screen. There we go. Oh, I see uh, Commissioner Powell. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, it occurs to me since this is so deeply embedded, this this onboarding is so deeply embedded in our uh, the policy uh, that we have. Um, perhaps, uh, Commissioner Clark, when you're finished with the when you've checked every box on the onboarding, um, you could. Uh, we could have a conference call yourself, myself, and Commissioner Malloy to, to determine if there are any shortcomings in the policy or areas within the policy that require update. Uh, there, there isn't any other uh, person right now more qualified to give us insight on, uh, on how effective that policy is and whether it needs updating or not than someone who's just gone through the process and a uh, governance chair who is charged with uh, uh, executing that. So if, if, if with your with your indulgence, if you could sort of commit to that, I'd really appreciate it. Well, I definitely will. I'm still learning now, but uh, yeah, in due time, I definitely will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. Um, I see another hand, uh, Commissioner LeBron. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, Mr. Clark, you're going to be temporary. So I know we're having this conversation for long, longer term board members who we know for sure we're going to have two new board members come January of next year. Um, I, I think it's, it'll be critical to somehow put in there for individuals to review our policies and our procedures. Um, I know that they're going to be meeting with different administrative team leaders and members from the cabinet. Um, but I also want to reiterate that the training that the state provides us as new board members, in my opinion, is not adequate um, and um, sometimes, unfortunately, not really relevant to our size school district. And you, that'll make more sense, Mr. Clark, as you go through it, um, because oftentimes it is really geared at school districts as a whole, which include our suburban counterparts and even our rural districts. Um, but certainly districts that have the ability to have a tax levy and control that and how they make decisions, which we are not. So they do touch a little bit on us um, and the big fives, but I would like us to figure out um, some more adequate financial training for board members, whether they're new and ongoing and have it be an ongoing um, piece. And I know that that was part of our PD last year um, but I, I certainly think it needs to be an ongoing PD for board members. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. LeBron. Uh, do I see any other hands looking for any other comments? Questions? Commissioner Malloy? Yes. Um, Apparently, I'm not, I'm not allowed to answer, raise my hand. Oh, but okay. I, no, 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 very no, you're, briefly. Oh, you're not allowed to raise your hand. <laughs> okay. No, just kidding. Um, uh, go um, ahead. I did uh, just briefly want to say I agree with Commissioner LeBron. I think that although the folks uh, at the Monroe County School Board Association and even the New York State School Board Association uh, attempt to put together meaningful uh, professional development for us in terms of finances or our jobs as fiduciary agents, I think uh, by and large in the past, those professional development sessions have been uh, tailored around the needs of uh, suburban and the lives of suburban school board members. And, and, and their professional duties. So um, I don't know how you might address that, but I, I do agree with her observation. And we've, we've, we've asked them to uh, tweak it a bit for us. And even then, I think it's, it's a tough uh, adjustment 
for them. So uh, as you continue on in your chairpersonship, uh, any way that you could examine uh, how we could get additional or how they could spend some time developing something a little more uh, suit to uh, our, our district, that would be appreciated and help us do our jobs in a more effective way. Thank you. Thank you, President White. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions at this time? I'm not seeing any other hands. Okay, so I guess uh, moving on to our next agenda item. Um, I believe that there is a new addition to our agenda this evening regarding school board liaison assignments um, for pre-K or preschool programs. Um, as you know, each commissioner is assigned uh, schools and we serve as liaisons to them. Uh, the past 10 months have hindered us a, a little bit from serving the way perhaps that we all want to serve these school communities. Um, but I think I can speak for everyone. I say we want to be back in these buildings visiting with admin staff and students as soon as safely possible. Um, and hopefully we're all engaged in and making uh, the time to do that. Um, so I'm going to turn the time over to President White to provide us more information about the proposed changes to the liaison roles. President White. First of all, I want to apologize, Commissioner Malloy. You and I played telephone tag today and we were never able to connect. Uh, thank you for putting this on your agenda. The superintendent, the vice president, uh, and I were discussing this uh, topic this morning. Um, I'm trying to remember who brought it up, but somebody brought it up at the officers' meeting. And it's a good idea that you know we should assign um, board members to uh, those earlier school programming, to that early school programming. And, um, and, and I suggested that uh, this topic should appear first uh, before your committee. Uh, you've summarized it very well. It's not a complicated thing. I don't know how many of these programs we have. I think we might have to do a little uh, research unless the superintendent is prepared to present those list of schools now. But um, I appreciate you putting, oh, I see something going, there's a screen going up right now, board liaisons to preschools and pre-K programs. Is that uh, PowerPoint, does that have a list of the schools? Yes, it does. So I'm, I, I know uh, this afternoon in the board officers meeting, you did ask for me to provide a little um, presentation on this. Thank you. I went ahead and um, put a little something together and I will be assisted by um, or Deputy Superintendent Morris um, and uh, potentially um, Director Robin Hooper of the preschool programs um, who can um, also provide uh, some insight onto uh, what this request would entail. So. Okay. Alia, just to interrupt for just a moment, I have to say kudos to you for putting this together in what, an hour and a half, two hour time? Um, <laughs> so you pulled all this together and I, I applaud you. So a kudos for, for that effort. Thank you. All right, so I'm just gonna go quickly through this um, and Janelle, please feel free to jump in wherever you see fit. So um, right now, um, Rochester does have, Rochester City School District does have um, pre-kindergarten programs that um, are not in elementary schools um, or district centers. Um, right now, actually, there are two programs, the Florence Brown Pre-Kindergarten Center um, that's um, located in school number 33, and that's located on Webster Avenue. And then we also have the Rochester Early Childhood Education Center. Um, there is also the Montessori School of Rochester, but that already has a board liaison. As you know, Commissioner Malloy, you are the board liaison to that um, uh, school. But those two essentially remain without a, a board liaison. We also had slated this year um, a center that was projected to open September 2020, but it wasn't able to do so. If you recall the presentations um, that were done by former superintendent um, Terry Dade regarding the, the attempt to um, increase enrollment for the district and that was proposed to be done by bringing in-house another preschool program um, and that was supposed to be the Rochester Early Childhood Education Center and located in the south um, uh, part of the district. Um, that program I would need a little bit more in, insight on whether or not it it will be indeed opening, but it was stalled due to COVID this year. So essentially at this time, there are only two um, uh, programs right now that would be up for um, kind of any kind of board liaison. And that has to do with um, just Rochester City School District led programs. Now there are uh, CBOs and those are community-based organizations. As you know, we have 18 in the district. Um, 
But um, there are a few things that I did want to discuss with you um, with the help of uh, Deputy Superintendent Morris and um, Ms. Hooper, because um, the state really mandates district responsibilities as it relates to that, and, uh, those organizations, as well as um, the, there, there may also be some concern regarding conflict of interest. As you know, several of our board members do have affiliations with some of those mm -hmm. based organizations. So um, we will need to discuss that a little bit further. Um, right now, the CBOs are monitored by um, Executive Director um, Hooper um, per the state's regulations, and they do the health and safety checks. They do um, the visits to the different schools. They look at reopening information, um, and they follow the New York State's guidelines. Um, so essentially, if the board does indeed have interest in being liaisons to those community-based organizations, the discussion would be a little bit different than it would for um, the, uh, the centers that I, I discussed previously. Um, why don't we try to, uh, Commissioner Malloy, if you don't mind, if I continue to try to facilitate this conversation. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so why don't we deal with the pre-K uh, idea first? There's two centers um, that our, our district uh, run. Um, Kalia, could you put them up again? Sure. This seems to be the easiest task before us tonight. So it's just those two. Um, uh, first of all, does anybody uh, think that, uh, does everybody agree that this is a, a, a good idea to appoint board liaisons, at least with respect to Rochester's pre-K programs and the two that are listed there? Does everybody agree that's a good idea? If somebody thinks it's a bad idea, just, just uh, speak up now. That's the easier way to do it. Okay, so it appears, um, I'm going to my participant list that, oh wait, oh no, there's a number of hands being raised. Let's let's deal with those hands first. Vice President Elliott. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to comment to uh, Commissioner Malloy's comment with regard to uh, board liaisons visiting their schools. And I just wanted to offer, uh, I'm doing um, school liaison visits virtually so uh, I have Zoom meetings with, that are scheduled with all of my uh, liaison schools. So if commissioners are interested in even doing Zoom calls, Zoom meetings, uh, that's an option. So I just wanted to um, share that as a recommendation. Suggestion. Thank you, Vice President Elliott. Right. Yeah, noted. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice President Elliott. Commissioner Adams. So um, two things. Um, I would like to be the liaison for Rochester Early Childhood Education Center. Um, I went there um, when the big controversy about pre-K was going on um, last year at this time. And I went there and, and that's what I'm about. I, I, I will fit in good there. Um, they, I will be able to uh, be a good advocate for them. So I feel it, it's like a duty for me to... Um, offer to be the liaison there. Um, and also, <laughs> I don't know who, who who's not um, participating with their schools. Uh, I'm doing remote and in person. <laughs> you know, um, I, I've definitely been doing that. So, and School 10 is amazing. The work, the, 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 the remodernization work there, it's, it's, it's really a, uh, 24th century school building. <laughs> it is beautiful. Um, uh, Commissioner Adams, I'm sure there's not anyone who's, uh, who uh, would want to take your place given your experience at Rochester Early Childhood Center, but I'm gonna continue to go down the list, uh, see if anybody else has any interest, but we'll, we'll get back to that. And I'm sure we'll get back to uh, an undisputed nomination for you to serve as the liaison for that pre-K program. Uh, so just let me finish going through the list though. Commissioner LeBron. Yeah, um, well, I just wanna comment on, on Commissioner Elliott's um, comment about the virtual and I agree. Um, I will say there are board members who are not doing either virtual or showing up in person. And I know that you show up to 
we we all hear it. The streets talk, Commissioner Ellie. I just want you to know. But I I just want to say um, it's going to be really critical for us to show up in person as we're reopening in this hybrid model because we have made the decision to open and we're asking staff to physically be there and students that it's equally important for them to see us there um, to give our support however we can. Um, for me, I. I'm, I guess I would like to take school number 33, but then also I'm confused as to um, if school 33 already has a liaison, why wasn't the pre-K assigned to the board the member that was the liaison there? Because I have schools that have pre-K um, in their building, and I made the assumption that, that I'm also the liaison for the pre-K side and have done pre-K um, visits as well. So if we can just get some clarity around that piece, um and ricardo i was gonna ask for early childhood education but i'll let i'll let it be i won't <laughs> only because that, um i do believe they also have a stronger larger bilingual but um certainly would love to have 33 if no one um is going to claim it or it's not attached to the liaison that's already assigned to school number 33. uh let's see commissioner powell oh. Sorry. Uh, yeah, um, school 33 is my liaison, is a school that I'm liaison to, and I assumed that, that, that the pre-K program was part of my responsibilities along with the school proper. So, I, um, you know, I would, having assumed that, I would hope that I could, could um, be tasked with that. President White and yes. commissioners, I just wanted to jump in. I put my hand up because I didn't want to interrupt um, any oh, okay. of your comments, of course. But um, thank you for letting me speak. I just wanted to let you yes. know that as Commissioner Powell stated, she is the liaison for School 33. So my suggestion to the group would be to allow Commissioner Powell to re remain um, the liaison with that school, it should be considered as a whole unit. So then we needed one um, liaison to be designated for the Rochester Early Childhood Education Center that would be on North Clinton Avenue. Um, I, I, I don't see any other hands being raised and let me just say- well, I can uh, take that if that's all offered. I mean, if that's open. No, 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 I think Commissioner Adams has- Oh, and, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So I'm, I'm looking through this list and, and I um I want to make sure that I've recognized any hands that being raised and I don't see any right now. So I, I'm going to propose a solution uh, and just see how people feel about it. Of course, uh given Commissioner Adams' connection with that school as he's already described, uh I would uh, suggest or propose or move that he can he serve as the liaison to uh the Rochester our early uh, childhood education center. Um, is there any objection to uh, Commissioner Adams serving in that capacity? No, no objection. Uh, I'm looking at the list and I don't see anything. So Commissioner Adams, um, you are so designated. I, we, we traditionally have not used resolutions to appoint board members in, in their positions as liaison. So I'm not calling for a formal resolution. Uh, it is uh, recorded such that it's on uh, the district's website. And this change will be reflected on this district's website. Now, uh, with respect to school number 33, there's been, this was a very healthy interest in school number 33. It's been, uh, uh, Commissioner LeBron has graciously volunteered to serve there. Uh, Commissioner Powell, um, who is already assigned at 33, um, has also graciously served to serve as a liaison to 33's pre-K program. Is there any other comments uh, about uh, our options there? We have options, which is good. I'm looking to the participants. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I didn't raise my hand. I just- um, No, that's all right. Um, I do want to point out though, that if the South Center is open, which my understanding was going to be the old school 44, I would like to be put as the liaison for the South center if it ever opens just putting it out there now especially before mr adams because we're neighbors and that is right around the corner from both our houses <laughs> so commissioner commissioner lebron has laid dibs on um, number 44 and that has been noted as you would say that has been noted for the record and again the interest is is healthy and it's good that board members want to serve as liaisons i'm gonna break um, y'all up i'm gonna go and take it <laughs> <laughs> 
You gotta live in the uh, Southwest, Cynthia. <laughs> All right, so uh, Commissioner LeBron, um, given the administration's recommendation and given your interest in 44, which hopefully will open down the road, uh, do you have any objection to Commissioner Powell serving as no. the I, Thank I, you. No, and I made the assumption, which is why this probably wasn't on here before, is that she is the, whoever was the liaison, we now know it was Commissioner Powell, that it just kind of makes sense that pre-K would fall under her as well. Thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Powell, we don't, uh, as you know, we don't do any formal resolutions. Uh, it appears that you are the unanimous uh, 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 candidate to serve as liaison for school number 33's pre-K program. And um, for the community out there who may not be aware of it and are may not be watching this meeting, our staff will make sure that uh, this is properly recorded in the various uh, websites where a person would identify who the liaison is. And, and I know that a number of board members have commented and rightly so on the importance of staying connected with schools. All of us do it in different ways. Um, just the other day, I was reading uh, to children who are connected with the school, but the event wasn't held at the school. Um, so I think everybody does it differently. And I, I would agree with everybody who said it's an important part, particularly given COVID, that we reach out in the way that we deem best. Everybody does this job as liaisons differently. And, and that's the good thing about having a democracy with seven different board members. All right, um, Commissioner uh, Malloy, uh, the agenda is still yours. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much again to Kalia um, and our staff for putting that together. Much appreciated. Oh, oh, oh Commissioner Malloy, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, there, there was the, eight, the, the matter of the 18. CBOs. Um, CBOs that I didn't address. I apologize. Oh, oh okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let me let me just, if if I may, uh, Chairperson Malloy, let me continue to address this. I think that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and I, I just me, I, I would of course curious to see what other folks have to say. I, I don't know that I'm prepared to address what would be the best way. That's a lot of organizations, um, and we could literally split that uh, by seven but I don't know if that's the best way to do it. So I, what are other people's thoughts on the 18 CBOs? Uh, and, and again, Kaya has raised some other issues like conflict of interest that we would have to address as well. I'm willing to suggest that uh, we, we, we sort of put that on the table, set it aside and, and figure out uh, how we might approach that and have staff and the administration and general counsel get together and, and talk about that and give us a presentation with your permission, Commissioner Malloy, at another uh, meeting. But what's everybody else's view about those 18? I'll go to my participant screen. Hold on a second. Uh, yes, I see Commissioner LeBron. Yeah. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, to, I guess my personal and professional opinion is that we have no authority at the CBOs whatsoever. Like, it, I think we would be trying to cross boundaries and lines that we have no business in. Um, and also all the CBOs have their own boards um, that they're responsible to report to. Um, and in the CBOs, they are primarily led through um, following regulations through the state of the Office of Family and Children's Services, not the Office of New York State Department of Education, which are vastly different regulations. I've shared this before multiple times. Um, sometimes it feels like night and day what we expect our CBOs and our early childhood providers to do versus K through 12 um, and, and the things that they have to go through. I would personally not be interested in, um, I guess, navigating through how to insert ourselves in CBOs in this capacity as a board member, other than the relationships we have with them now um, and the work that we do in collaborations, because many of these CBOs work with us throughout the district and other capacities too, not just early childhood education. Thank you, Commissioner LeBron. Commissioner Powell? Um, yeah, my input on this is that um, uh, uh, Commissioner LeBron has a valid point about them being a separate institution and, and their own boards, but that doesn't mean that that we can't have a, an informal relationship. So my, my thoughts on divvying up who would get those uh, is um, what if we simply um, all were provided a, that list, uh, submitted our, the, our um, desire for 
you know, to to our clerk uh, or and to you, um, and and let you break whatever ties need breaking in order to ensure that all of those are covered. But I wouldn't expect those relationships necessarily to be the same kind of relationships we have with our schools, where you know, perhaps it's a um, um, ceremonial, perhaps they, they would like for us to uh, come and visit and, and we would be available to, to come and visit upon invitation. Um, th that's a different kind of relationship than we might have with, uh, uh, you know, with a, uh, one of our own schools. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. Uh, Commissioner Adams. So, Last year this time, I was told, I was told that um, there's, there was no conflict of interest and by, by our own legal. Um, and I found that hard, hard to um, accept, I believe, um, whatever. And here we are again. Um, Cause we had, we had um, board members that worked with some of these C worked for these CBOs. And so um, I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just think we really need to, um, I, don't, I don't know if we need to try to step her in there like that uh, because I, I believe there is a conflict, even though we were told by, um, it was put on record by legal that there was no conflict. I still um, question that. And so I really wouldn't want to be a, a, a liaison for a CBO. Um, Commissioner Powell, I'm going down the list here, uh, folks. I see Commissioner Powell, Commissioner oh. Clark, and then Commissioner Vice President Elliott. That's an old hand, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, Commissioner Clark. Yes, you know, having been the CEO of an organization for over 25 years that worked directly in the schools, I would have loved to ha have had a relationship with the, with the board commissioner because even though the goals and the outcomes and the contractual obligations may be different, but there are ways that they can be complemented within the schools and having that ear on the school board as well as working directly with the administration. I, I, I think it's a win-win situation and it's something that we really should look into. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Uh, Vice President Elliott. You, uh, Commissioner Clark, you sort of took the words out of my mouth. Um, simply because when I go out to the schools, um, what I have found is that they want us there. And what I would ask that we probably uh, should get some kind of, uh, of um, survey or something to find out if they would like for us to uh, come out. Um, I, I think that um, uh, those pre-K po programs would want to see us um, out there. Um, but, you know, maybe we need to have some data around that. But I know that I am welcome, um, as I'm sure other commissioners are when they go into the schools. In fact, one of the... Um, pre-K programs that we had to deny invited me to come to see their programs. So I'm invited to uh, these programs. And, um, you know, if, if we're looking, if, if the, the thought is, is that, you know, we're going to come out to criticize, I, I think that they want us out there. You know, uh, they want to have a relationship. They want us to be able to advocate for them and just to see the good work that they do. So, that's my thought. You know, I agree with uh, Commissioner Clark around that. Um, you know, no, <laughs> you know, nobody's afraid of us. You know, I, they're not necessarily. You know, they just want us out there. They want the support, and that's you know one of the things that you hear uh, in our schools is that they don't necessarily feel that um, central office provides them with support. Um, and so here's an opportunity for us to help to change that, uh, that paradigm. So. Thank you, Vice you know, President. I, um, yes. I know that a Superintendent Meyer Small has been trying to raise her hand as well. It looks like that the hand raising part is really not working today. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Why don't we uh, let our superintendent address it, and then I have on the stack uh, Commissioner LeBron and then Commissioner Malloy. Uh, Leslie, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening again. My suggestion is was mentioned. I'm not, I can't remember quite by who. We have 18. Why don't we reach out to see who would like to have that connection? Pair the number down to to whatever the accurate number is. Find out who is interested in um, participating, and then just make some assignments. I like that idea. Um, uh, did, why don't we finish going through the stack? There's only two people left. And then if people want to follow up on the superintendent's idea, which, which I think is a good idea, um, we, can, we can see if there's some consensus around that. Commissioner LeBron? Yeah, I guess, um, Leslie, you kind of took the words out of my mouth <laughs> because my suggestion was also going to be that we should be asking the CEOs too if they're interested. Um, with all due respect, Mr. Clark, you were a CEO of, of, of or, you know, urban, not urban suburban, but the um, urban league. And yeah, they had different programs. We also have a relationship with Hillside and the YMCA, and they do similar programs that have nothing to do with early childhood education. And so I, I, I guess for me, my hesitation and my cautiousness is that I know how we are as a board and individual board members, and we all have different perspectives, and we would be trying to come in to potentially, and I know Commissioner um, Elliott mentioned that we're not going in to dictate some people do kind of go in that way. And I want to be, us to be very cautious about that. I would like to see who's interested in having us be there. Any CBO, CEO at any time can reach out to any board member um, to have meetings and discussions and invite them. And I've gone through many CE, CBOs at the invitation of CBOs to come in through the CEOs to come in and to walk throughs and meet with them and learn more about how they partner with the district. I just am very cautious about what this looks like because what I know my role as a board liaison to support my schools and be advocates for them. Um, and what Ricardo, um, Commissioner Adams mentioned was this conflict of interest, which I do think has a potential to um, come up if we start to develop relationships with some of the CBOs in a way that we're now advocating for more dollars for one CBO versus another. Um, and so there's just too many unknowns for me in this regard. Um, I would not support it, but I would be interesting, interested in hearing from CEOs directly who would be, um, who would want that type of relationship. And also while we're asking them if they want the relationship, what they envision that relationship looking like. Um, and creating those boundaries. And I would feel more comfortable if they themselves created the boundaries for us. Commissioner Malloy. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Commissioner LeBron. Um, I echo many of those concerns, um, as, as also the concerns that expressed by uh, Commissioner Adams and Commissioner Powell. Um, I had the opportunity last spring to visit um, several CBOs uh, when we were undergoing uh, that, that important decision that we had to make. Um, and I was just really thrilled as, a, as an educator to um, have the opportunity to see our program, um, our program that is so successful and one of the most successful uh, pre-K programs in the United States, to see that in action in a CBO environment, which I hadn't before seen firsthand. Um, and so I, I was really pleased at the different organizations that actually reached out to me and invited me there. Um, you know, I visited ABC, also visited um, the VOA Center, as well as a child care center near MCC. Um, it was nice to see what um, our program looks like uh, in these environments. So I would be fully supportive, um, just as Commissioner Elliott and Commissioner um, Clark have, have said, uh, that, that we maintain some degree of relationship and make sure that we, we know what's happening in, in these centers, not to monitor or um, evaluate in any way, but just to, to see how we're serving the many students of our district. Um, and I thank those organizations for their partnerships with, with our district um, and the services that they are providing our students. Thank you, Commissioner Malloy. Um, I would uh, note on the uh, conflict of interest issue. My recollection is, and I, I could be wrong about this, Steve could uh, immediately correct me, but the conflict of interest issue that our former general counsel address was related to particular 
board members and their relationships to uh, CBOs. It wasn't, and again, I, I could be wrong about this, it wasn't a blanket uh, statement that there is a conflict of interest whenever a board member or when board members deal with uh, these CBOs. I think the issue was could board members who had relationships, uh, and, and that term is used very vaguely by me right now, could they vote on the whole CBO issue that we were addressing a year or so ago? It, it was limited to that. And, and it wasn't a matter of whether we could, as, as an institution, whether there's a conflict of interest for us to deal with CBOs. I don't, I don't think that was the uh, legal assessment that was given. It related to two board members who had some uh, kind of relationship. And he concluded that whatever that relationship was, it wasn't enough to constitute a conflict which would prevent them from voting on that particular resolution. Uh, we could ask Steve as part of maybe deliberating on this at another time, should our chairperson be willing to put it back on the agenda in terms of how we deal with these 18, we could have our general counsel, uh, acting general counsel, Steve Carling, uh, do another assessment or do an assessment on whether there's a conflict or not. I think that might be the way to proceed, but I, I, I do think there, there was, that, that research that he did related only to those two board members. And he, your, Commissioner Adams is right. He concluded that there was no conflict, but it wasn't about generally whether it is a conflict for us to uh, address these uh, CBOs. Um, the other White, thing is- President, yeah. sorry, President White, uh, just a time check because we're yeah, yeah. No, 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 absolutely I, I, running I, out of time here. I, I, I don't want to cut myself short of uh, getting an opportunity to speak. The other quick thing that I'll say is that um, uh, Pre-K is an integral part of the district's success or failure, whether it's a district building or whether it's a CBO. And that has been stated over and over and over again in research time and time again uh, to Commissioner uh, Clark and Vice President Elliott's support of this idea. I think what also supports this notion that we might do this is that um, we are our success or failure in many ways is contingent upon the success of the pre-K program. So if, if uh, our chairperson agrees to put this back on the agenda, because there's a time check here, I would also ask not only that Mr. Carling uh, be, be brought into it to make sure that there's a proper legal assessment. Secondly, that Ms. Hooper, uh, that the superintendent consults with Ms. Hooper. And finally, to the superintendent's recommendation that we survey and ask these uh, CBOs whether they want this relation. I personally, like Commissioner Clark and Vice President Elliott, I think it'd be a very healthy thing if for no other reason, we will not be successful. These are 18 CBOs, 18 CBOs. They are feeding children into our system that are ready uh, and prepared. If we don't have relationships with those students and understand what they're doing, that could affect our, our, our effort and, 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 and doing it going forward could make us even more effective. All right, uh, uh, Commissioner Malloy, uh, you're right. There's a time check at 741. Uh, this uh, committee meeting was supposed to end at 7.30, but we already had you behind the eight ball, so go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so next up, I would uh, just, uh, yeah, next up, I'd like to quickly, thank you for bringing that to our attention, uh, President White. Um, I'd like to quickly bring up something that might be helpful for us moving forward um, as a board. Our general counsel, uh, this is just regarding board resources, um, our general counsel provided us with an excellent overview of Robert's rules of order last night following our organizational meeting. Um, this was many or one of many of our professional development opportunities that we will be taking part in as a board uh, relating to governance. Uh, the Robert's rules book that we all receive as commissioners is incredibly in depth. It's super helpful. It's also a pretty thick uh, we usually end up using information from chap mostly from chapter 16 of this very thick text. Um, and it can get a bit complex at times. Um, so in talking with our general counsel, um, they recently recommended an excellent supplemental text on Robert's rules, um, explained in layman's terms, um, that I really think might be a great resource for us as, as board members. Um, it's Robert's rules in plain English. Um, that's the title of it. I re recently purchased my, my own copy of it and it's only $8 a copy. Um, I would like to suggest purchasing copies of this really inexpensive text for each of our board members um, because it came as a recommendation from general counsel. Um, so it's $8. Our total cost is going to be like $56 for this. 
Um, and I'm just wondering if someone could maybe, um, it, I just wanted to hear some discussion around perhaps if that's something people on the board are interested in. Um, it's a really helpful book that I think would be really relevant for us as uh, board members. I'm just looking for hands here. Um, Commissioner Adams, is that an old hand? I see Commissioner Adams hand up. I didn't know if that was an old or new hand. No, it, it's not an old hand. Okay, oh, go ahead then, Commissioner Adams. My hand. You're muted. My hand has been up because I, I try to be um, reasonable in these meetings. But when I say something, I mean exactly what I say. Um, to act like when I talk about conflict of interest, I was talking about people who were employed by um, those agencies. And that's what Carl had spoke on. He said, even though that they were employed, um, so to act like for us to even pretend like I was just suggesting some broad sweep, I was suggesting specifically people who are employed by them, there's gonna be, a, should be a conflict of interest. And we're gonna have two more new board members come on. Um, so it's gonna be an issue of concern for me. Please, um, when I say something, I try not to say much here. Don't try to um, misdirect what I'm saying. Um, now you got me going. So now that I'm saying something, um, I'm gonna say something else that bothered me today. Is all this long list of all these people that died. Did any of them die in the school? Did any of them catch, catch COVID in the school? Come on, let's, we, 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 we continuously putting stuff up, dispense stuff. I'm, I'm getting upset. Y'all don't want to have a second person to start going off at this board, man. Please, I'm trying to be calm and, and, and like an ambassador here. Um, let's just chill out. Let's just chill out. Commissioner Malloy. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Commissioner Malloy, I, 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 can't, I can't raise my hand, but I, I would like to be recognized at the appropriate time. Okay, is it, is, yes, is I will, yes. Yeah, um, I, I want to, oh, go ahead. There is another hand that's raised prior to you. So would you like to respond after I, I call on sure, the sure, person? absolutely. Okay, yeah. uh, Commissioner LeBron's hand is raised. I kind of feel like, Commissioner Malloy, I feel like just giving Van the opportunity to respond so that I can, my, my question to you is directed to what you were talking about. And so I know Mr. Adams didn't have the opportunity to address this prior to that topic being closed. So if that's okay with you. Thank you, yeah, of... that's fine. I didn't want to interrupt your, because your hand had been raised first. Thank so, you. okay, thank you for bringing that in and for uh, that grace, thank you. Uh, President White, go ahead. Yeah, um, Commissioner Adams uh, raised a, a couple issues and I, I want to address the first one, which was speaking directly to the issue. Um, Commissioner Adams, in case I wasn't clear, I want to be very clear now. What I understood Carl to say was exactly what you understood him to say, which is people, I, 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 the, the, the nature of the relationship was not clear. And it, there was some controversy about whether they were employed, whether they received funds, these two board members who, by the way, are entitled to some level of discretion when we talk. So that's why I'm speaking somewhat in generalities. But the point I was trying to make, Commissioner Adams, is we, we could even do what Carl said or not do what Carl said and still be in compliance. So in other words, if you got two board members, not everybody works for a CBO. I don't. Commissioner Powell doesn't. Commissioner Malloy doesn't. Um, uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Clark doesn't. So, so the, the only point I was trying to make, Commissioner Adams, is that we could ex very well accept some of these, all of these 18 CBOs and make sure that someone who was employed as a board member or had some kind of relationship wasn't connected. That's the only point I was trying to make. I wasn't trying to water down your remark. I was merely trying to say that the issue was whether they were employed or had a financial relationship. And if there was none, anybody could serve as a liaison to one of these CBOs. That's the only point I was trying to make. I wasn't trying to water down your remark or, or criticize it. I was merely saying that even if you accepted what th this issue that there was a conflict, it only applies if someone is employed. We have at least four board members that I've said don't work for community-based organizations. So we could literally take the 18, if, if that's what the board decided to do, 
and have each of those 18, 18 divvied up amongst those four board members. That's all I was saying. And, and I'm sorry, Commissioner Adams, you, you raised another point and I wanna make sure that I respond to it. What was it? Because I, I do wanna address it. Commissioner Adams. My point is um, we, we tend to do a lot of things, man, uh, for special effects or whatever. Um, and I just, I am not, I am not with um, some folks that don't look like me telling me um, what's best for me. I'm, I really am not with that. Um, another thing is um, people talking about um, all these, all these people that die. I don't think, okay. I don't know if any of them caught COVID in, in, in the school district. So we need to be clear that we're not giving off um, just inaccurate impressions, man. Okay, and, and I thank you for reminding me because that was the other point that you made. And you're, you might be right, uh, Commissioner Adams, um, that maybe 90% of those people, 100% of those people did not die in schools, that they were teachers and they passed away. The, the own, remember now, we have a, a policy that says people can speak their mind. And she began reading that list she had the right to do that under our bylaws, whether that was whether they were teachers or not, she had the right to do that. I'm just keeping it real with you, Commissioner Adams. This wasn't a show. I did not believe, as chair of the uh, meeting, that it would be appropriate. And I made a call. And if you and others disagree with it, that's okay. I did not, this is from the heart, Commissioner Adams, I did not feel it was appropriate to cut off the list reading of a list of people that had died from COVID whether they were teachers or not. Now, other people might disagree with that and they might have handled it differently, but that's how, where I was coming from. Now, whether that advanced, maybe you think in an inappropriate agenda that she made, but again, I'll remind you, we have our bylaws that say people can get up there and say whatever they want. She was well into that list. And I just personally did not feel like we should, we should be cutting her off in the list and the reading of the names of people who died, whether they were teachers or not. It's, it's a threat and I know you know that, it's a tragedy, and, 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 and I just did not feel right about cutting her off. It wasn't an attempt to support her and whatever she was trying to do, uh, although I'm extremely sympathetic with anybody who takes a moment to recognize people that died from this illness. But I want you to know, it, it wasn't an attempt to advance her agenda or not advance her agenda. It was, an, for, in my mind, an, an awkward moment where a person was reading the names of people that had died, no matter who they were. And it just wouldn't have been right to cut, in my mind, wouldn't have been right to cut her off. That's all. That's all. So I apologize if, if, if someone thought I was trying to advance an agenda. No, I don't apologize for that. I'm telling you, I wasn't trying to. I was just trying to be gracious to her and to, more importantly, to those people who had died. That's it. But thank you for raising that. I, I, you know, I, I, if, 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 I, if you hadn't said that and I hadn't responded, you might not know where I'm coming from. And that's all it was. Just, just allowing a person, without regard to whether they were teachers or not, to have the gracious moment to recognize people that had died. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Malloy, uh, for allowing Commissioner Adams and I to have that exchange. Um, uh, please continue on, I'm sorry. All right, well, um, thank you. Um, I, I certainly appreciate, appreciate both uh, your comments. Um, however, in the, <laughs> with respect to the time that, that we have, um, and just, we have so many constraints on our time as is, and we have another committee meeting to start following this. Uh, just with respect to that time, I would like to suggest, uh, we've just finished, well, we were talking about board resources and a, and a book that I wanted to purchase or um, see if the board was interested in getting $8 copies of this book. I actually don't need one. Uh, it would just be six copies, um, $8 a piece. Um, if people are interested, uh, please just let me know so that we can perhaps uh, purchase copies of those. Perhaps people can just email me. Um, if they are in fact interested in, in receiving a copy of um, that layman's terms uh, book on Robert's rules. Um, but just with respect to time, um, I'd like to move on uh, to our next topic, um, which should have been um, regarding Board of Education compensation, but I, I really don't feel like we are going to have adequate time to have a, a full discussion on this this evening. And I know I had promised that we would talk about this from last month. Um, but I'm thinking we need to reserve and, and share this information at next month's meeting. We do have time. I've been informed by general counsel that we do indeed have time to further this discussion at a later uh, date. Um, so with respect to our time constraints this evening, 
Uh, is there any opposition for, for me to just go ahead and, and talk about our, our final topic this evening, which is the- Commissioner people. Malloy, I have my hand up and um, I just had a clarity question on the book purchase and if we're purchasing the book by giving you the money out of our own pockets, which oh. I would I would be more comfortable doing that. Like I, I'll purchase a book. I have a, you know, Robert's Rules um, Cliff Notes version as well, but I would be interested in seeing the book that you're talking about, sure. but I would feel more comfortable that we pay for it out of our own pockets. And okay. if that's the case, I can cash up you some money, but that's what I want the clarity on, if you can clarify. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there anyone else who might be interested in, in the, a similar option for this? I, I, do, I do that too. I, th I think that makes sense for me. All right. Um, well, if anyone else is interested, feel free to email. We can work out all the, the other details later. Um, I'm sure Kalia uh, will, will arrange something for us. Um, no need to cash at me. Um, sure, cash at me. Um, come on, LeBron, cash at me. Uh, no, uh, with all due respect, I'm sure we'll work that out. But I, it's a great resource and came highly recommended. Um, so thank you. I just email if you're interested. All right. so. I'm going to go ahead and just move on to our final topic this evening with the promise that we will revisit the board compensation discussion at next month's meeting, um, which is February 2nd. We do have time uh, to make that happen, but I feel like that discussion is going to uh, be a very lengthy discussion. Um, and just with respect to our time tonight, I'm just going to move on to our, our final topic, if, if you don't mind. Um, so with that being said, our final topic is quite easy. Um, we are, let's see, right, so our final agenda item, very quick, um, just based on the feedback that I've received from everyone from our discussions as well as from recommendations uh, from board staff, uh, we're going to be reformatting the poll that we've been taking at the end of each meeting. Mm -hmm. um, instead of a Zoom poll, we're going to be reaching out to our IM&T department with board staff to determine a better polling option for our purposes. Um, and we will be working on this over the course of this month. And I'm hoping that we will have this ready to go for our next governance meeting in February. Um, however, if there are specific items um, that members feel we should be included or that should be included rather in our polling, please reach out to me or simply email some of your preferences. Um, although you, will ex you can expect to hear from me um, in this regard over the next few weeks as we develop a poll um, and reach out to our IMT department to find the best polling techniques. So um, with that being said, um, are there any questions regarding the poll um, at this time? I'm looking. Are we going to have the poll tonight at the end of the meeting tonight? I think that, that, that'll be our final time using the Zoom one, right, Kalia? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, should be, should be. Okay. I don't see any other hands, so I... Mr. Malloy. Yes, go ahead. Um, as, as you know, I had prepared a um, kind of a template for us to talk about uh, a structured way to look at possible resolution. Might it be helpful if in advance of the February meeting, we I email it to people so that they can come in maybe with some, some thoughts already, um, and then we can walk through it. Oh, is this help. regarding the compensation issue? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that, that would be acceptable. Okay, I sent it to Kelly. I'll just have her forward it to everybody. And thank Wonderful. You. I'll send the I'll send the resolution language as well. Um, it was it was shared previously um, to the board, but I will send that along with the uh, points of consideration from um, Mr. Carling. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you, Mr. Carling. All right, and that concludes the governance meeting. We will meet again February second, um, and so I hand the gavel. Um, do I hand the gavel to Commissioner Powell? for our policy meeting now, or do I hand it back to President White? Whatever works. I think you can just go ahead and give it to Commissioner Powell. Okay, well, I officially hand the gavel over to our new policy chair, Commissioner Powell. Um, thank you and have a good night. Is it Thanks. possible to take a little, about a five minute break? Yeah, that, that may make, that makes sense. Or I'm you all can go on and I'll just take a break, so. Well, why don't we give everybody, unless there's some objection, why don't we give everybody five Yeah, that's, five I didn't want there to be any objection people wanted to continue, but. Yeah, uh, hope, Anybody hope, have any objection to a five-minute break? I just want to say that I do hope that we'll be able to make up for our overtime 
uh, through the policy committee meeting, but uh, yeah, five minute recess would be fine with me too. <laughs> okay, all right, so it, there seems to be no objection, so that's what we'll do for five minutes, thank you.
back to the Board of Education uh, committee meeting. Uh, we've just begun the policy committee uh, meeting after a recess. Um, our first order of business is to um, affirm the minutes from our uh, last meeting, let's see, which was November 3rd, uh, committee meeting of the whole via Zoom. Um, do I have a, mo a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. I have Second. a motion. Uh, was that Commissioner Clark? Yes. It was. Okay, thank you. Uh, a motion and a second. A any uh, disagreement with anything in the minutes? Hearing none, uh, if I could have a vote, uh, if everyone could turn on their cameras. And uh, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much. That dispenses with that. Uh, the next. Uh, one quick second. It looks like you have one other set of minutes, uh, Commissioner Powell. My apologies. December oh, 1st. December 1st. Uh, oh, gosh. I didn't, I didn't even see those to review them. So I'll take everybody's word for those. Um, do I have a motion to approve the December 1 meeting minutes? So moved. Was that Van? Okay. Yes, uh, a motion. Second. Uh, a second from Commissioner Adams. Discussion. Disagreements. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Aye. No, no. Okay. So it's unanimous. Thank you so much, Calia, for keeping us on track. Um, the next item on our agenda, we have. Um, hold on a sec. We have one uh, new policy that's being recommended or that's required by a new law. Uh, and uh, Steve Carlin's going to go through that for us. After that, we are going to um, receive an update on the, the work plan from our, uh, our staff support, Rahim and Lynn. Um, and uh, and then I'll uh, talk through, uh, well, actually, when as, as Steve gives his uh, presentation on the, the student voter registration policy, uh, when he finishes his presentation, I'm going to ask us to work through all of this, the decision steps that need to be made to move that policy from um, a, a sample slash draft policy to uh, a working document that we can move to the full board. Okay, Steve, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I, in, in essence, we're we are required to have a system in place to allow students to um, what's called pre-register to vote, students who are, are young adults who are 16 and 17 are allowed to pre-register uh, with the election board so that when they do turn 18, they are automatically uh, registered to vote. And a law went into place um, that states that school districts are required to uh, have a policy to enable this to happen and put some parameters around it. It can be as simple as saying that the board, what you'll see in the first couple paragraphs, the boards believes that this is a good idea and just de directs the superintendent um, or some other type of designee to offer all students the opportunity. Um, there's no real parameters around how that happens. In our case, we would probably then uh, turn to a superintendent regulation to put the details in place for that. Um, the board can get specific, such as here, when it says next portion of the district will do so by um, I, I probably would not recommend this necessarily and that it's very much in the weeds and um, more something since we have uh, a, a more um, sophisticated uh, superintendent suite, the capability of drafting a resi you know, its own uh, regulation and coming up with a good plan for this. Um, we have a director of, you know, we have a chief of academics, we have a director of social studies, people I've reached out to 
are ready to see if they'd be, um, you know, how we would do this. And there's certainly the capability there. Um, and then the next portion, you can certainly put in students who do not wish to pre-register, do not have to do so. There'll be no, there'll be no penalty. Um, that's fine. I mean, as a, as a policy, that's, that's a good one. That's actually the law anyway. Um, any policy that just reflects back the law is fine with me. So um, that's, that's all there is to this. It's, it's relatively simple. Um, this, the method of pre-registering is as simple as getting them to the website on the Board of Elections and having them fill out their information. Um, and you know, we, could, we could find a way to incur, make that either part of a class or I'll leave the details of that certainly to um, administration. Um, but those, that's, that's what this policy is relatively simple. Steve, um, Vice President Elliott has her hand up. Well, I took it down, but I will um, ask. Um, I, I I think this is is uh, good to get our students um, prepared. What I was going to ask was about uh, th there's still no electioneering that can occur on grounds, correct, Steve? Oh, that's correct. No, no. Yeah, and because they won't be able to vote until they're 18. Yeah, this is, but it, it, yeah, I mean, you can have discussions about elections. You can have discussions. We can have mock debates. Okay. Um, it's it's in the interest of learning. Um, but what you're talking about is is different. Um, and this this is simply just trying to get kids in the system so that we don't have it trip up when they turn 18 and they forget. This, this is a way of getting them um, so they're automatically eligible, so they don't show up at a poll on election day and somebody tells them that they can't vote. Hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. Are there yep. any other are there any other questions about this sample that's presented? Yeah, no. I can't see hands when we're in this format. I'm, so. I'm looking, I'm looking at hand I see no hands. So uh, from the, the first decision point is uh, who the board wants to direct to uh, to actually implement this. Uh, my recommendation is that we direct the superintendent or his design, his or her designee. Um, it, it's kind of a pro forma language. Is there any objection to that? Going once, going twice. Okay, so Rahima, when we next see this, it'll say the superintendent or his or her designee. Um, the, the next decision point then is, if we scroll down, uh, the, the question is to whether to get into the weeds, to use Steve's language. And um, my recommendation would be that we have a single sentence that uh, directs the superintendent to promulgate re regulations. Um, such that uh, all of the details can accompany the policy in our in our manual, but uh, have the flexibility of changing uh, as the superintendent sees fit through that delegation. Are any comments or con concerns about such a such a sentence? Nope. Really, everybody's good with that. Okay, let's scroll down farther. Uh, is it how can we enlarge it just a little bit on the screen by chance? Uh, I think Rahima is doing that. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and so the, the last decision point is, would be, um, you know, do we want that closing sentence? Uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable with that because it reminds people that, um, th that there is no direct or, or coercion here. Uh, is everyone comfortable with that final sentence? Okay, so that addresses all of the uh, decision points that were built into the sample. Um, uh, the next decision point that I would add to that is if we're going, if we're asking the superintendent to promulgate regulations, is it the pleasure of the board to see those regulations before we adopt the final policy. 
And I really, I really need to hear people's reply on this one. Uh, I, I would like, I for one would like to see them. Uh, okay, and Beatrice has her hand up. Yeah, I would like to see them as well to understand how this is going to be implemented from the superintendent's perspective. Um, uh, Ma'am Superintendent, do you have a, a, a vision in mind, uh, like what great, what classes uh, this might be presented as part of, or? This is the first time I'm seeing it, Commissioner Powell. What I'd like, I mean, it makes me, it makes sense, certainly in social studies classes, that seems like it's the best touch point. But I'll certainly collaborate with Dr. Morris, Dr. Black, and um, our director of social studies. Our, sorry, direct Dr. Morris and Dr. Black, and we can make sure and socialize that to make sure that that's the best way to go. Okay, great. Uh, Commissioner Mal uh, Amy, Amy, I see your hand is up. Uh, yeah, uh, just to reiterate what the superintendent says, just as a social studies teacher, I was going to suggest going to our social studies departments. Thank you. Uh, and I think there was some conversation before the meeting started about it being part of the participation in government class for those who are seniors and haven't, haven't, uh, hadn't, perhaps hadn't turned 16 as of, uh, uh, their their eleventh grade social studies class. That way we kind of catch everybody. Um, but that's you know that's just uh, repeating conversations overheard. <laughs> okay. All right. So the next decision point is: um, Does this committee want to see the draft uh, with uh, with provisions that we just discussed? prior to having it leave the policy committee? Or can we authorize Rahima to make the changes and um, uh, to this sample, uh, deleting all the gray parts and, what, and, the, and the commentary and bring it to, back to the full board for its first reading this month? The question is, do we need to see it here in policy committee again or are we, comfortable enough with getting this moving through our business meeting and the, the three-step adoption process and through our business meetings. Comments, well, David? Well, again, I can't raise my hand, uh, okay. but I, 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 I like that the last option that we just send it through to our business meeting. That's my preference. Yeah, I, I concur. I was going to recommend the same. Okay. Does anyone object to that? I hear no objections. Um, so uh, without objection, uh, the, the sample policy will be converted into a draft policy and presented to the full board in its January, what's our January meeting, Rahima? The 21st. The 21st of January. Again, one more chance to, for, to hear objections. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Uh, okay, that, that uh, piece of business is dispensed with. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, the work plan for policy committee. Uh, as, as it has been outlined for you in last month's meeting uh, when uh, Commissioner Clark was chairing, uh, I'll just ask Rahima to walk us through uh, the immediate next steps of that of that uh, work plan. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. Um, as of after last meeting, we had a small committee meet together, including Superintendent Commissioner Clark, um, board staff, and several administrator administrative staff, to just hash out some of the details that were left from um, the policy update process. And so, I will share with you all. Um, a couple of documents that we created. So what you're seeing now on the screen, and I um, apologize, you're only seeing portions of it because it is a rather large document, is going to be the policy master um, calendar that we will move through. So what you see is block one, each um, set of policies, so about eight to 10 policies, as we discussed, were broken out into blocks. There was discussion about what would be priority and made most sense to start with. And so we will begin on January 13th with our bi-weekly subcommittee meetings. We'll meet bi-weekly on Wednesdays uh, from four to five. 
and we will review policies um, according to this calendar and the process that we put forward. Um, there is a condensed version of this calendar, which will be posted to the website, which I'll share now as well, um, which will be posted to the website for the public to see and follow along. Um, as we've discussed, we're highly encouraging the community to um, weigh in and give feedback on policy and be involved in this process. And so felt that the sharing of a calendar online would allow community members to um, sign up to speak to the board about any specific policy that is being reviewed um, at that time. Additionally, we have um, policy 2410, which is the policy adoption policy has exhibit E which is the criteria for policy analysis. That document um, as it stands online is a scanned version um, and it is not editable. So the document that you all were emailed and is posted on board docs is just a user friendly version of that. No changes have been made to that document or any of the language. Um, again, it just allows for us to utilize it as um, essentially a cover sheet for each of the policies that we review. Commissioner Powell and I did have a conversation and she made a suggestion for a potential um, alteration that I'll um, ask Commissioner Powell to talk about. Um, yeah, my suggestion to Rahima was simply that there are going to be a number of policies that we, um, that we deem uh, sound as they are that, uh, that probably don't need changing and so to um, perhaps expedite some of those uh, and, and maybe you know fast track them and do them and do that fast tracking parallel to some of the subcommittee work, we could list more than one policy uh, on the top of the page, uh, you know, mark them as existing and, and just refer to them as, as annual review. Uh, and if we if we sort of bundle some of those uh, uh, and, and put them out to the board, well, certainly to run them by the, the superintendent first to make sure that, that she and her team think that they also should remain the same, that, that we then could um, uh, provide an abbreviated form uh, on the grounds that we're not recommending any changes and none are called for by law, and that uh, perhaps even as we have batches of policies running through the biweekly subcommittee, we might be able to um, offer up to the, the policy committee and the full board uh, some uncontroversial uh, policies uh, to get them processed while we're waiting for some of the more complex work to get done. Does anyone have any objection to that strategy? Mm -hmm. Commissioner LeBron has her hand up. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you, Rahima. I just have a couple of clarity questions around the policy manual updated projected calendar. And I've lost my monitor here. So give me one second because I, can you guys still hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. My monitor kind of goes in and out. It's overworked. Um, so the policy manual update pro projected calendar, just a clarifying question if this calendar actually meets the recommendation from Dr. Jallo and her refindings and it's under table eight organization structures and internal operational efficiency findings and recommendations. Um, and the recommendation was that the district administration and the board shall collaborate to develop and implement a process for regularly reviewing all district policies. And this process shall be established and implemented and should start by January 1st, 2021. So just a clarifying question, I guess, for Dr. Jallo, if this meets that, and if it doesn't, if you can give some clarity then on that recommendation. My other um, conversation piece is really around the criteria for policy analysis. And I noticed that there is actually no equity or anti-racist specific language in here on how we review our policies. And I would like the board to amend this document to be very specific around um, having an equity lens and an anti-racist lens and how we make decisions around the policy and what the implications would be through those lenses on our students. That's a great point, and I'll, I'd like to circle back to it, but I would like to get Dr. Jello's answer. 
uh, to your first question. Okay. And Rahima, did you have any, uh, I, I gather you were working directly with uh, Dr. Jallo and the superintendent to create this? For the calendar you're referring to? No. So right. we did, we met with the superintendent. We did not meet with Dr. Jallo. I didn't, I'm correct, did not meet with Dr. Jallo. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm seeing this new other than looking at it in the packet. So my question was going to be, I was going to ask it offline actually, you know, what actually is the process? How does one take policy 4200? Who gets it first? How is it reviewed? Who gets it second? I don't know the process that you're going to. I, I see. So um, Rahima talked us through the the subcommittee process a little bit last month, talked about um, the subcommittee being tailored to the subject matter. So for, for example, with, this, with these special education blocks, uh, starting tomorrow, an, a, an email will go out to uh, members of the special ed team that the superintendent has identified. Um, uh, uh, outlining what policies we want to look at and inviting them to a meeting. Uh, and that meeting date will be what, Rahima? January 13th is the first meeting. First meeting, January 13th. And um, so the process is that for each block of policies that are, are up for review, we assemble a team of the most um, relevant players and decision makers uh, um, and bring them to the table. And the, and the point of, of putting this work plan together uh, and, and, and advertising it is that these would be essentially uh, open meetings, even though they're not meetings of the board, to allow uh, parents and community members to listen in uh, and, and um, weigh in on uh, some of these um, policy conversations. So when, when administration comes to these meetings, have they already done some pre-work on the policy or is it a fresh start when everybody's together at these meetings? My I interject, Commissioner Powell? Please do. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that the subcommittee meets bi-weekly and they have the first look at any policy block. After they've approved that block um, for draft, it will then be sent off to um, executive cabinet where they will have um, up to 30 days to review and make any recommendations. At that same time that they're reviewing any um, relevant uh, parent group. So in this case, CPAC will also receive those policies and be asked to weigh in and provide recommendations. At the end of those 30 days, it will come back to the policy subcommittee to consider all of the recommendations that were provided and then to make some final decisions about what the draft policy will look like. And then that block would go to come into the policy committee as a whole to just review and weigh in and provide more feedback. And if necessary, um, go back and do some more work otherwise to move that block of policies along um, and towards adoption. So, I mean, if this is a process that you and administration have worked together and figured out and agree upon. My only question is similar to a question mentioned by Commissioner uh, LeBron about what kind of process are you going to use to review your policies in lieu of your strategic plan and the priorities that you've laid out for yourselves in your plan and the priorities you've laid out um, as a board that they are part and parcel of the process of reviewing these policies. My main goal is that you do establish a process and that it's collaborative. And, and it seems like um, that's what you have tried to do here. Right. And, and to answer uh, the question of that very, that very first meeting, the 13th, my hope is that folks will have read uh, the, the policies because they'll have had advance notice of the meeting and that, that they'll have given them some real consideration before we even come together so that the meeting isn't spent as a cold read okay. as were of those policies, that we can become productive right from the first moment that we gather. Sounds good, thank you. All right, and now the, the second uh, point that uh, Commissioner LeBron made was, ah, equity. Um, 
I am so glad you mentioned that because um, one of my, my personal goals was the, the policy adoption policy itself uses sort of a, a process that um, we call it the information item, the discussion item, and the action item. But a number of folks since then have come onto the board and into the administration who are more comfortable with language like for the first read, second read, third read. So one of the policies I'd like to sort of push to the head of the line is our policy adoption policy and, and try to give that, uh, that policy. I think we still need the three-step process like all government bodies do, but refer to them in the language that more people are comfortable with, with, which is this first, second, and third, and final read. And in the process of updating that policy, uh, we can update this form and, um, and ensure that, um, that one of the steps that we uh, do before we um, move a policy into its final form is, is to look at the equity aspect of every policy review, reviewing. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Yes, Beatrice. Yeah, just as a follow-up, um, I would support that and I intentionally use anti-racist and equity both um, because I don't think what, they're both the same. So I wanna make sure that we at least can establish that as language that we all agree to um, figure out a, a process to have a lens. Um, there are a number, uh, actually, I was just looking this up today. So San Antonio as a city also created a rubrics for themselves on how they make um, policies and financial decisions specifically from an equity and anti-racist lens. But it was a very lengthy project for them. Um, and certainly, I, I would hope that we would at least in creating the policy that you're recommending around policies, that there is a heavy influence from our community um, and what that language would look like and what anti-racism um, lens would look like and feel right for them. So I just wanna put that out there. And then to kind of circle back to what Dr. Jallo said, um, when I reviewed this, in my mind, I'm also trying to figure out how does the work that we're doing tie into Dr. Jallo's report and what the timelines that were identified through her report to the state and if we are linking them some way, somehow. Um, and I mentioned if this calendar would go into that section, which is on page 42, you guys. If, I forgot to mention the page if you wanna pull up your um, state monitor's plan. But um, I see that April through May is when finances are on there, but I also know that in the plan there were some financial policies that Dr. Jallo recommended that we um, focus in on sooner before that timeline. So I would just like to, I'm okay with this timeline, but I would like to pull out the ones that are in the state monitors, um, the financial plan and prioritize those even before these dates so that we meet the deadlines set through this plan that we already voted on and agreed to. If I could respond to that. Yeah, uh, Commissioner LeBron, the po policies that Dr. Jallo um, had identified in the plan were pulled out and they're not included in this timeline. They're on their separate timeline to meet those um, requirements. So we made sure that it aligned. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And, and Rahima, if you'll take this uh, special note of the, the language of equity and, and anti-racism uh, so that as so that we can uh, pay attention to that when we're uh, recrafting the, the form. Okay. We'll do. All right. Uh, any other comments? Questions? Um, this is, this is going to be a heavy lift no matter how we slice it because uh, so many of these policies have, uh, in part because so many of these policies have gone unattended, which means people don't even know what they say. <laughs> until we go into the review uh, process. Uh, a lot of, the, and, and we've had so much turnover that um, there, there's probably not a single staff member uh, in, in the uh, administration who was here when the policies were first created or even last reviewed. 
So um, I, I think it's an important first step in making sure that um, um, that we do the right things in the right order. And, um, you know, certainly the consent decree uh, or um, settlement with uh, Empire Justice uh, dictates that we pay attention to this, these special ed functions first and that, uh, and, uh, you know, that just the um, events of the day have dictated the order, the sequence of events that we have to tackle these in. But as I said, I think there are a great many policies that are um, pro forma that we can move through uh, sort of uh, on a fast track or simultaneous to the work of the subcommittee. And I, I promise I won't try to push through anything that has that raises any objection from anybody. If, it, if there's an objection from a member of the board or the administration, um, then it will be taken in its regular order. Um, but uh, I think uh, in the end, if we clear, if we move through uh, policies that are uncontroversial, uh, we can um, uh, possibly, possibly uh, shrink the three-year timeline into something less than three years. That's, that's my ambition for the committee. Any other comments, concerns? Okay, the, the next item on, our, uh, on the agenda is a review of NISBA updates. I don't think there are any. Rahima, am I right or wrong? That's my understanding, but I, Mr. Carlin may want to chime in on that. I, I don't get the NISBA stuff unless it comes through you. So if you haven't seen it, Rahima, I have not seen it. <laughs> no, there are no new updates. <laughs> right. Aside from the voter student voter registration policy, which uh, is essentially created through new law um, that I think Cuomo uh, uh, announced not too very long ago. Is that right, Steve? Um, yeah, it was a little while ago. Was it? Okay. Well, uh, I believe that concludes our agenda. And I as promised, I think we collapsed the time to, uh, I, don't, I don't remember when we were supposed to end, but um, President White, uh, I'm happy to turn, yeah, 8.30, we're only off. Right so. Seven minutes. Yeah, you're like that last leg in the Olympic sprint team, that, that person that they can depend on to get us across the finish line. So thank you very much. That was, that was my doing with all oh, your oh, <laughs> Not the anchor leg. Yeah. Also, Will is not the anchor leg. No, I came before the anchor leg. Oh, all right. Well, either way, we, we did cross the finish line, sort of. Um, we have some a number of matters that uh, we have to discuss in executive session. So technically, uh, Dr. Myers uh, Small is the anchor for this uh, particular uh, uh, event. Uh, so uh, to remind folks out there who may not be familiar with it, sometimes in the course of these meetings, there are matters that involve personnel issues. Um, sometimes we have to consult with our lawyer that ha have to or should be discussed in executive session that is in private. And this is one of those occasions. The board has to meet with our, our superintendent to discuss a number of matters relating to the terms and conditions of a particular employee. And so we have to discuss in executive session um, by law. And so uh, I'm asking for that motion right now from one of my colleagues. Motion. Thank you, Commissioner Malloy. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. All those in favor of going to an executive session for the purpose of discussing the terms and conditions of a particular employee indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? All right, we're getting ready to go into executive session. Um, I don't think there's anything that we're going to come out of executive session and vote on. Um, is that right, Commissioner Myers, small, or the clerk? Is yeah, you're right. You're right. Oh. Okay. So, so for, for, for the, yes. should we should we do our survey while we're in open session? Well, you know, well, well, no, because we wouldn't have finished the executive the executive session as part of our meeting. 
So um, for those of you who are, are interested in following the board, not much is going to happen when we come out of executive session, except we're going to do a survey, which uh, they're not made public until later on, I guess. So we, we wish you all a safe and good evening, um, unless any board member wants to say anything to the community before we go into executive session. All right, um, then uh, I, I did get that motion. Didn't I get that motion? And it was seconded. Did we vote on it? I'm sorry. All right. You did. Then we'll You're <laughs>
it is still uh, December, uh, January the 5th, I think is the date, right? And uh, the Board of Education, January, is it the 5th? Am I, am I got that right? Yes, yeah, the fifth. You're correct. And uh, we're we're about to wrap up our meeting, but before we do that, uh, we are uh, we taken a commitment. We've had a commitment to commit a survey, complete a survey at the end of every meeting, and we're about to do that right now. Well, Van, before we before we sign oh. off. Oh, yeah, I, I won't I won't forget before we s sign off. Um, on the survey, you have two points of personal privilege, right? Right. Oh. So everybody, don't don't hang up after we do this survey. Uh, I've lost the survey. Where is the survey? Oh, there it is. Okay, um, Kalia, tell me when uh, everybody's finished and then Commissioner Powell, um, you have the uh, opportunity to do some brief points of personal privilege before I lose the ability to communicate because it's slowly evaporating from my... That's fine. In fact, I'll, I'll start now so while people are still finishing up. Uh, the first point I wanted to make is, I, I didn't get this before our meeting started, but apparently the, I did look for our, our parent rep during our policy committee portion and he wasn't online. I, I have since discovered an email that said that uh, Mr. Joe DeFiori's wife just had a baby. Oh, which, wow. Which is why he wasn't on, uh, on Zoom for the parent rep. Um, I've asked uh, by way of re email reply that Rahima um, uh, communicate to uh, Joe DeFiori uh, our congratulations on behalf of the full board. Um, the other point of privilege I have uh, isn't quite such happy news. I uh, got another email um, while we were in executive session that I, I think I've told you that uh, a member of my writers group, Terry Lair, uh, was, uh, had written a book about the Spanish influenza epidemic here in Rochester. Um, and she timed the release of her book for the 100th anniversary of the Spanish flu. Um, she just passed away on mm. Sunday. She had, uh, she had been recently diagnosed with a brain tumor, but while she was in hospice, she contracted COVID. So oh. there's a degree of irony that a woman who wrote deeply about the history of Spanish flu here and right here in Rochester. The book was called The Black Velvet Band, if anyone's interested. Um, and I, I imagine you could still get it uh, through um, uh, Amazon. It's like a, a print on demand book. Um, but uh, so it's, it's not entirely certain whether she died of COVID or of the brain term or she was already in hospice in either event. But uh, my prayers go out to her family and her research on the Spanish flu is an important part of Rochester history. Well, our prayers uh, go to her and uh, to all the families that uh, seem to be suffering. We all seem to have that connection. Um, so again, let's be thoughtful and prayerful for all those families, but please communicate that. And um, to, to uh, the, 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 your colleagues in the, in the book club as well, Willa, because I know they share in the loss too. Um, Rahima, to this idea of uh, giving a note of congratulations to our parent. Oh, oh, Rahima uh, is no longer. We Okay, well, Kaya, could you communicate this to her? Um, mm -hmm. what, and I don't mind going out and buying a card. I think, you know, I know we all can't sign it because of COVID, but we ought to get the, the man a card and say congratulations. We, we can and should do that. So um, I'll, I'll drop off the card. Are you going to be working tomorrow, Kaya? 
I'm always working. <laughs> I'll drop off the card, and uh, so long as the board approves it, which I assume they will, we'll, we'll have it signed on behalf of the Board of Education. Congratulations. He's, a, he's part of our family, so we should do that as well. Any other comments? Ben? Uh, yes? If you come in the office tomorrow, come see me so you can sign your oath card since you're there. Anyway. Oh, right, right. Okay. Um, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion. I heard a couple people say it. I think I heard uh, Second. Commissioner Adams and I think I heard Commissioner Powell. I, if I didn't hear them, then that's okay because we're going home. All those in favor of adjourning for the night, uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Good night, everybody. Thanks night. for yeah. hanging in there. Good night. <laughs>